check one, two, check, check. Carlos, um, applicant's going to be wanting to use the Elmo tonight. The, um, that's what I thought. We need to make a copy of that if we can. It won't. It won't. It won't show up. So we've got. Can we make a copy of that?
it's, it, it's going to work that same way. Cottage food changes. Hot mic. <laughs> so cottage, cottage food changes that are out there are not real. Are you talking about skin? Yeah. And so then you have language that what we were talking about in the sidebar is if, if there's now something that's saying we don't want to do. doesn't say that. Still has to get a business tax. Or I think what the problem is going to be. <coughs> cottage, let's have a cottage food. Not so much meat. And beef. Oh, okay. Oh, so. Is this how it's going to be? Because I think it actually works. What I was telling you about is that the tax license for produce. We're ready to go. Good afternoon. Welcome to the uh, July 13th, 2021 Flower County Planning and Development Board meeting. At this time, do roll call. Michael Boyd. Present. Timothy Connor. Jack Corbett. Here. Mike Goodman. Here. Mark Melangelo. Here. Anthony Lombardo. Here. Fernando Melendez. Here. Thank you. We do have a quorum. Thank you. Go ahead and pledge to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. First item on our agenda is to the approval of the June 8, 2021 regular meeting minutes. Does everyone? Uh, I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. Uh, two motions to approve. Everyone good? Go ahead and pass the minutes for uh, the June 8, 2021 meeting. All right. Well, um, everyone here is. Uh, probably aware, but this is a quasi-judicial process. The audience should refrain from clapping, booing, or shouts of approval or disagreement to avoid potential legal ramification and possible overturning of the decision by the courts. The public hearing must be fair in three aspects, form, substance, and appearance. Uh, the time limits, uh, the staff will have 10 minutes for the presentation, applicant 15 minutes, public will have three minutes then the applicant could come back and have 10 minutes along with staff uh, comments, another 10 minutes. Uh, item number four on our agenda tonight, uh, we have a continued from May 11, 2021 meeting. Uh, this is application 2357, the dis determination of the use of the C2 commercial and shopping center district. Um, this is also a quasi judicial requirement disclosure of any ex parte communication of this application. Has anyone had any discussions in the recent weeks in regards to this application? 
We'll move forward with a staff presentation. Mr. Mangle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I listed this first. We, we did have a, a bit of a sidebar discussion uh, with uh, 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 some of your membership kind of asking if, if we could move some of this around. I've got no problem with that. And, and so I'll tell you my design with having this on the agenda in the order where I had it is the idea that if, if we're not going to take a, a, a specific action other than continuing this forward to our our August meeting, then and let's let's get through it. Let's let's do that. And and realizing that the action on this is dependent upon the marina discussion that we'll have it, it later on. And so that uh, that, was, that was my expectation. That's why I listed this one first uh, to be able to to hopefully dispense with that and and not rehash anything that's already been discussed. But realizing that the the marina discussion that we'll have is is the is really the the reason why this was continued. And, and so I guess with, with that, if we want to talk about the marina portion instead, uh, we, we could do that. I'd, I'd rather at least take care of this bit of business and, and just move forward with the, the continuance to, to our August meeting and so that we can, we can get that out of the way. Uh, and, and so the, the reasoning there again, if you recall from our May meeting, I was to schedule a workshop with the board between May and now. That didn't happen, and so effectively this is the agended workshop. Uh, and, and so we're gonna talk about, among the items to discuss, the, the marina uh, proposal that, that uh, we've come up with, some options, some parking requirements from other jurisdictions, uh, some things for you to consider. Uh, and, and with those discussion items, I, I, you probably noticed on those, and I'll get closer into more detail on those, that uh, you know, those aren't expecting any action today either other than your comments, your direction uh, from, uh, from, your, from your discussion. No specific actions anticipated, but you, you'll, you'll guide me in what you talk about and what I'll bring forward to you as a Land Development Code amendment, uh, ideally at the August meeting is what I'm anticipating to come out of this. And so then we'll, we'll pick back up on the determination of use. One, one caveat I need to say, and probably should have said it last time, and I was chastised by some fellow staff who will remain unnamed, wait, Gina Lemon, that um, our Article Three requirements, and if you, if you look closer at the C2 zoning district, it, it obligates the planning board to make a determination of uses that are not otherwise listed in the C2 district based on the SICK manual. That does not tell you that you apply that to a certain parcel. And I ran down the rabbit hole that others have done, uh, relying on, on, really guided by an applicant. Uh, I'm not blaming him by any means, but you, you see even how I agended this. This is how I agended it originally in May. And, and the caution, the, the learning that I have to do, and I think you all have to retune your, your brains to this as well, the, the issue on number four is not, is a marina appropriate for this parcel? It's should a marina be determined to be similar to other uses permitted, permissible within the C2 zoning district based on, based on the definition of marinas in the SICK manual. So that's why if you recall, and we got that in your packet in case you wanna talk about it, the guidance is from the Standard Industry Classification Manual, the SICK manual, been replaced by the North American uh, Industrial Classification System, NAICS. And so I included those that information in there. I included it not only for marinas, I think I included it where I had applicable areas for storage, for warehousing. I wanted to make sure you had those tools. In the end, you could make the determination that marinas are similar to uses, other uses listed in C2, either permitted or, or permissible through a special exception. And in the end, Mr. Million doesn't get what he wants at his parcel. You know, that, that there's there's the, the distinction there, maybe it's a distinction without a difference. We make it permissible, it's a C2 zone parcel he's got. You know, maybe if there's anything else, there's questions of scale, parking, those other things to be, to be still discussed or still worked, worked through. But the important consideration, I think, the hindsight I have, and you see it how it's listed here in item four and how it was listed back in May, you're not to take the request and say that, well, this, this doesn't work on A1A. 
you're not making that determination. You're making a determination very broadly that marinas was a use that was not specifically listed in C2 and that for your guidance to add it as a permitted use in C2, you rely on the definition of this in the SIC manual and you rely on those other uses that are of a similar nature presently permitted in the C2 zoning district. You're, you're drawing that analogy, the, the analogous relationship between those by saying, well, this is like that because the SIC manual says that this use that we're talking about is has these characteristics and these characteristics are similar to these uses that are presently permitted or maybe permitted through a special exception in the C2 district. Do not run into that path that says, I'm applying this to, to this parcel. And, and so that's, that's my caution. I did it, I think we did it too much in May. No one's prompted me to say this other than a voice in our office who said that that's continuing to be read wrong. And the guidance that's in that section of land development code says this is how you treat it. You know, don't apply it to a, a parcel that may come later, that should come later. And so with that, uh, my recommendation on item four is that, uh, and I think there's probably still some folks that want to come and talk about it. If you want to hear from them, great. I, I don't want to you know, prevent anyone from making their comments on the record, but I, I'd like to have the discussion on the determination of use uh, held off until August because I think that's when you'll be able to make a decision after we have our marina discussion this evening and whether or not marinas should be more broadly included in the land development code. That's, that's the question that you gave me the homework on. It wasn't, it wasn't a determination of use. As I understood your charge, Adam, go forth, figure out if we want to make this a land development code amendment for marinas. And so that's separate from this issue, but it's, it's definitely tied in uh, with that request. And, and so with that, I'll close, wait any questions or comments, and, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Mingle. Do we need to, Mr. Mr. Um, Connor showed up, um, do we need to call him in and make it aware that he's, he's here or? I've made the note for the record. Thank you. Mr. Langello. I have a question for Adam. Okay, so I definitely got what you just said. Makes sense. Um, it, you were relying on the sick manual we don't. We then superseded it to another manual that wasn't mentioned in the code, which gave some confusion to our meeting a few months ago. But if we have our own definition of it, then we no longer have to go to that manual. And that's what I thought we were. That's we correct. Were, we were sort of in a quandary because we were in this um, quasi nowhere land, and it makes sense to to um, continue this item until we can appropriately determine, you know, for Flagler County what. A marina is and, and that kind of stuff and then it would be similar and we'd have all that so I don't have any problem with you know with your concept of and I agree with you I think we should hear from the audience and if they have any comments you know and they'll be invited again at the next time we do this but it you know it, I think this is probably appropriate to be tabled and if, if I could add one point and then and so if we follow this path and I, I've got no problem just to, for people's uh, time management here I don't think people necessarily want to talk about our our own internal uh, makeup of the of the planning board. So I, I listed that first because I figured on our discussion items because I figured we could get through that because I, did, I didn't think that was going to be real real big barn burner. I, I'd be just as well if if we move forward with the continuance on this, flip that agenda so that the next item then that would be brought up as a discussion on the marinas aspect, go into the scenic A1A uh, proposal that, that they've presented, and then make the last item then on discussion if we have time, which I'm hopefully we'll get out of here before 10, 10.30, the witching hour, um, whenever that is. But uh, we'll be able to then talk about that section on the on the uh, geographic area requirements and that section in in the in, in the land development code that talks about our membership, and so I'd, I'm I'm completely comfortable with that if we want to flip that order on the discussion just to just to make sure that everybody in the audience can make their comments sure. and don't have to listen to our, our minutia about our own stuff. If I could, Jill. I, I agree with most of what you just said, <laughs> except um, I um, as I pointed out to you earlier, we have some vacancies coming up on our board, and I would rather see the um, the makeup as a second item, okay. and then do the um, do the scenic game one last because we're, you know, time permitting, because we're, that will be coming to us sooner maybe. I agree with that. Do we need a motion for that? I don't think so. All right, so we'll um, open this up now to public comment. Um, 
Item number four, uh, the, the application 3257. If anyone from the public would like to step up and um, make any comment on, on this application, now is your time to do it. Um, when you come up to the podium, please state your name, your address, and you have three minutes. Good evening, uh, Dennis Spear on behalf of the Hammock <coughs> Civic, uh, Community Association. Adam, I just have a, do you mind if I ask a question? Because I'm not real clear on the process. <clears throat> and I want to make sure that it, my clients, everybody else knows. So the ordinance or the language about marinas, which is the other item, that we're going to have a discussion tonight. It comes back next month to the planning board. But doesn't it have to go to the county commission for adoption? Yes, yeah, ultimately it would. So, so then my question is, so if we come back next month, if, this, if the actual application gets tabled for another month, we're still going to be in the same position because the text language won't be adopted by that point, correct? Correct, yes. So, well, I, I see what you're saying. So that I, 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 I'm, I'm actually thinking that the, at the next, if we come forward, if it's decided that we're going to be doing a Marina Land Development Code amendment, the, the determination likely isn't needed. And at that point, we'll know it by August. I mean, I've got kind of the same comments I made okay. 60 days ago. I don't know that if, if it's going to come back at some future time, I don't know that I want to waste you all's time kind of regurgitating what we did 60 days ago about our position about warehouses and the sick code and things of that sort. Yep. So we'll be, if, again, if it's going to be continued, I'm just going to reserve my comments. I just, I just had a question about the process. Thank you. <clears throat> Gentlemen, Bob Million from Hammock Harbor. Uh, needless to say, I'm a little bit frustrated. I mean, we've at this for a couple of years, and I understood that the last meeting, that the challenge or the task for the staff was to come up with a recommendation for a land use amendment to resolve this issue of whether or not marinas were allowed in Flagler County. Um, it seemed I have no choice but to agree with the postponement or the tabling of it, um, but it puts us out probably another 90 to 120 days. And I guess at some point in time, we've got to decide um, whether or not we're going to allow a marina in Flagler County. I mean, they have been uh, developed for four decades. Um, they have been done prior to the, the existing code and post existing code. Uh, we've given all of the information to staff. Uh, we did not have a workshop. Um, I've been available for a workshop. I furnished information. So I see this as just another delay. So with that said, I have no choice but to accept your decision. Thank you. Um, I just need some additional information. Your warehouse up in St. Augustine, that's yours, right? By the marina there? Is that there yours? is a marina in St. Augustine. I differ with your term warehouse. Okay. Um, warehouse, marina, whatever you would like to call that's it. That's correct. You had one up there. How many uh, square feet is that building? First, I don't own it. I built it. I owned it at the time. All right, so you built uh, it. So the total built. building is about 82,000 square feet. Um, and, uh, there's and on how many acres is that located? 50. Well, the actual, actually, that site, no, it's on about uh, three and a half, three. Total site, you're saying, is three and a half acres? No, the, the site itself is about 50 acres. The marina site I can get you a specific, but it's around three to three and a half acres. Now, of the 85,000 square feet, roughly 20,000 is commercial. The boat storage occupies the rest. There's roughly 312 boats. And you're located on a, um, you're not located on the intercoastal, you're located on a uh, tributary? That particular one is on a tributary, yes. So there's no question about having a no wake zone there because of the, the area it's in, it's no wake to begin with, correct? I, there's no question about an awake zone there because it was prior to the time we developed it. And as far as residential, what is your closest residential to that location? 150 feet, million dollar house. Might be 175 feet. They're, they're building 
they're building the 40 acres adjacent to it, um, spending about $350 million uh, with a high-end development. It has started. There's a restaurant that was about $4 million directly adjacent to it. So it is a very high-end development. But you're located off a major thoroughfare to US-1. We're located off the US-1, that's correct. Thank you. My name is Jody Bollinger. I live at 5648 North Ocean Shore Boulevard. Um, I just had one thing to say to Mr. Goodman, and that was those uh, residences that have been built like 175 feet from St. Augustine Shipyard were built like within the last year. They were, so people who bought those residences knew that that shipyard was already there. And it's, like he said, it's 175 feet, but those, they're like two-story, they're condos, and they're, they were only built a couple years ago. So there are no other single-family residences near St. Augustine Shipyard. It's on US-1. Uh, when you come off US-1, there's a, a gas station. There aren't any, I just want to make it clear when that building was built, there were no single family residences near it. Thank you. I'm Jim Buckley, I'm the owner of the property. I live at 2891 John Anderson Drive in Ormond Beach. Um, my family had a small marina right down the San Sebastian River in St. Augustine, near the shipyards, as it would be. And so I was there for the last 25 years running that uh, for my family, along with my other, other businesses. Uh, just in point of fact, just to make things clear, uh, there's been a lot of exaggerations, a lot of outright, outright lying um, by people on the other side uh, to the public and, of, and to you in these meetings. Number one, just to answer that question right there, just to clear that up, there, was indeed, there is indeed a condo complex right down the street, right down the river. And it was there for a very, very long time. I watched it be developed. I watched it be occupied and sold. It's been there for 30, 30 plus years. And as, as a matter of fact, that development is now a strip, strip center with various restaurants or whatever in it. When it was developed and stayed there for 30 years, uh, it had not only a small strip center out front, but a dry stack operation right behind the retail center on US-1. And right behind that is a condo development, all done by the same developer, all within, I don't know what, you know, 500 feet, 500 yards, it's close, okay? So that's the fact of the matter is there's always been residential right near the shipyards. And the residential development that was there had dry stack marina in it. And next to that is another marina place where they repair boats and have slips. And next to that is a marina called English Landing. So, and just to also make some, some things clear here, one of the things that the, the other side is doing, this group of, of people who don't want, any, any, don't want the public on the river, which is really their position. They want any more people on the river. They want it for themselves. That's the bottom line. We've got, so these people have put out a picture of this huge facility, the shipyards, an aerial photograph, and they put it out in flyers saying, that's what we're proposing. It's an outright lie. And they put this out to the public. That, among other things, that I won't bother, won't bore you with is the lies that they've been putting out. But I will say a little more. Kathy, my next door neighbor to the north, and Cindy, they knew when they bought that property that it was a shipbuilding facility. The reason they got the property for the price they did was it was next to this zoned property and a shipbuilding facility. And I had those conversations with Kathy. And Kathy said she, knows she, got, she knew she got a good deal because it was that. And she knew eventually it was going to be developed. That was what she told me when I engaged her. Another thing with my neighbor to the south, John Russell, okay, 
he was complaining about propane tanks. Well, he sells propane tank, and he has an extremely large propane tank right on his property. So there's been all these exaggerations, all these lies, and I want to make sure that you guys get all the right data to, so we can hopefully get a nice facility in, into this area that people actually want. I get calls all the time. People want this. Thank you for your time. Good evening. Uh, my name is Scott Sowers, SC Klein Construction. Uh, we're probably one of the few uh, general contractors and marine contractors here in Flagler County. And I just wanted to reiterate that, and I, I was under the impression that we were going to have um, be talking about the uh, marina language being added to the LDC tonight. But uh, I would just like to say that this needs to be done as quickly as possible. And I hope that you know it doesn't get drug out 120 days, like Mr. Lean said. But um, uh, just want to reiterate that it's, it's very important for us that we have this uh, this written into our LDC. Thank you. I do not know. We, we haven't got that far yet. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, he's the applicant. He gets a rebuttal anyway. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, close the public. Uh, any more public comment before? Good evening. My name is John Doherty. I own properties on Pamela Parkway. Um, wanted to uh, um, be in favor of the dry stack uh, storage. I've owned uh, property in the hammock since 2003. I've been a Flagler County resident since 1998. Uh, um, have always been a boater since I've been in this county. Um, we have a marina uh, or basin now that as a, um, I'm fortunate where I have a boat lift and I have property on the intercoastal, but when I have to take my boat out when I'm traveling, um, if I have to take it out for service or whatever, um, you go to Bing's Landing, there's two major problems, Mike. Um, your restaurant occupies all of the eastern bound docks most of the time. Um, the other issue is there's a boat rental business being um, conducted in the park. And I've got a 27-foot boat with one motor. It's very difficult to navigate in that basin when you don't have any dock space. Then I've got to go uh, tie up my boat somewhere. You know, usually there's somebody kind enough where I could tie alongside of them and then go back to my truck, go park my truck, and um, come back to my boat. And uh, so having the dry storage, I think, would um, alleviate a lot of pressure. Um, it would provide jobs. Um, there has been dry storage in the hammock. When, uh, when I bought my first boat in 1998, we used the hammock dunes marina. I don't know if you guys recall that Mark May, you know, some of you guys, Tim, you've been around for a while. Bob Dickinson sat on this board. Clint Smith sat on this board. I know they would recall those days. Um, my point is um, this was previously a boat manufacturing business that operated at all hours. They had multiple shifts there. I don't think this is what the uh, proposal is, um, but I think it's just going to add jobs. It's going to add tax revenue. It's going to increase property values, and it's it's my opinion that the some folks in the hammock are being misled. Um, there's petitions, you know, available at um, Hammock Hardware um, when I was being attacked unfairly with false information um, a few months ago. Um, you know, I dealt with that. That was unfortunate, but that's just the way this whole system goes. Once you're in, you don't want anyone else in. When you got what you want, you don't want anyone else to have an opportunity to, to create a business or create value. And I think that sentiment has to, has to change a little bit. I think we need to kind of, you know, see how this could be um, helpful for the community. I know as the boater and the people that are buying properties in the hammock um, right now, whether they're in hammock dunes or, or just, you know, the common areas of the hammock, you know, having an opportunity to put your boat in dry storage is a huge factor and a huge benefit for people. So I'm in favor and I hope you guys will be as well. Thank you.
John Russell, 5652 North Orchard Shore Boulevard, Boulevard, the south side of the project. I have a 500 gallon propane tank at the hardware store. Everybody that touches that tank is a certified by the gas companies, by the state of Florida, to dispense gas. What you're requesting and asking me to do is let him put in a 10,000 gallon gasoline tank that nobody has to be certified, period. Anybody can go up there and grab the handle and pump gas. That's 100 feet from my bedroom. What do you think? Huh? Which one of you want that? 10,000 gallons, 100 feet from your bedroom. Don't worry about it. He's got insurance. My daughter can always buy new parents. Think about this, guys. That's a residential area. Excuse me, uh, sir. Anybody else from the public? Hi, my name is Janet Sullivan, and I'm a resident of the hammock. Um, a lot of people want in the, this dry stack storage. They think it would be great. I want a drive through coffee shop in the hammock. I think that would be great. This, gentle, the, this gentleman here, it's inconvenient for him to not have that dry stack storage. Well, it's inconvenient for me to drive all the way to Dunkin' Donuts in town every morning. But I'm not gonna get my drive through coffee shop in the hammock because it's not allowed. That is the point. It's not what people want, what they think would be a good idea. That coffee shop drive through be a good idea, but it's not allowed. That's what we have to figure out what is allowed, and that's what you need to base your decision on. Thank you. Anyone else? So we'll, we'll close public comment. Um, board discussion. Uh, I think as a matter of order, we need to let the applicant have a vote. Oh, yes. Five million for Hammock Harbor. I'll, I'll make this brief. I was going to save this. I will give a copy to you. I don't expect you to remember it. This pristine residential neighborhood, the scenic A1A corridor within Flagler County, if you count both sides of the road, occupies 22 miles, 22 lineal miles. Of the 22 lineal miles, okay, less than 1% is owned R1. There is 6.6% that's PUD. That's Ocean Hammock, Hammock Dunes. I'm only counting the stuff that, that aligns you know, with, the, with the road. 4.7% um, is state or county. That's Bing's Landing, you know, the parks out there. The rest of it is commercial. Now there's 43.9% of the land along scenic A1A that is owned RC. The intent of that is to satisfy the commercial land requirement for the future land use map. I have not seen much that has been denied in the RC zone. Now the RC zone is actually far less restrictive than the C2 zone. Setbacks are less. You can put more of a building on an RC than you can on a commercial. There's no requirement to put a house on it. So each one of these people that are arguing are living in something that one of these days they can decide I'll just take the, the front 200 feet of my property, which is already commercial, and I'll put a restaurant on it. I'll put a coffee shop on it. So let me go back to the commercial so you understand this. And I did this from the county assessor's map. And my math might be a little off, but it's, it's pretty close. Okay, of the total commercial area, what's there now, what has been built, what could be built, there's a total of almost four million square feet of buildings that can be built bordering scenic A1A. You just built one, you occupy one, okay. Everybody can do this. 
it is within the code. Of that 4 million square feet, 587,000 are in the C2 zone. The C2 zone, by definition, is high intensity, by definition, okay? But yet, you're allowing in a low intensity, specific to scenic A1A, more intense development, 4 million square feet. And they're coming up and saying, gee, don't put this building here. Now, I can put a 60,000 square foot hotel, 60,000 square foot office building. You can call it a warehouse, it holds people, okay? There's definition of these things. We have been delayed for two years over stuff that is just ridiculous. So I will see you in a month or two months. Thank you. So we'll close public comment now, and we're going to go to board discussion. Mr. Langello. I beat you, Mike. We'll, we'll I start. Okay. I always um, go to my right first by habit, so I'm uh, sorry, Mike. Okay. Um, I want to thank the public for making um, their cases. I, I, I do want to point out one thing, so I'm not trying to belittle what most people said, is the reason this agenda, this agenda item wasn't to specifically talk about a lot of things you guys are talking about. We're trying to determine the applicable um, zoning or, or if, if, as Adam was said, if um, a marina is similar in use to other uses in the C2 zoning and not to necessarily apply it to your yard in your neighborhood because that's actually, um, as uh, Mr. Bear can tell you, that is not actually correct. We should not be spot zoning and making zoning from one people because we don't like it here but we can like it over there. If the zoning, if a C2 zoning district allows it, it allows it. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Um, and I and I would like to make the motion that we continue again. But Adam, um, we will not have a, um, uh, if we have a, um, uh, a continuance to next month, we still won't have anything official because what we're gonna do is make a recommendation. So it would be possibly in two months that we would actually go through all the planning board and then the, the two meetings at the is it two for the is it two for the commission on a on a ordinance? It changes the actual list of permitted or permissible uses in the zoning district. Yes, the Florida statutes requires two readings. Could be done in a single month with a a day meeting and a night meeting. Requirement on the two hearings is that at least one of the hearings be held after five p.m. But we won't meet for another month from today. Correct. And then there would be after that meeting there would be two more meetings. So that's. Two, that'd be so we're talking about not the August meeting, but then possibly the September meeting before we would have um, codified whatever may happen in the in the land development code. Is that correct? We, that, that's correct. But I'll, I'll offer again. Uh, I would want to have this continued to the next meeting because if your discussion on marinas comes back and says no, we don't want to do this, the determination of use this application falls to the planning board. Okay. The planning board is the ultimate decider on the determination of use uh, for, for those other. So if, if you all ultimately decide through your discussion on marinas, eh, and, it, and maybe if you want to. Well, so what you're saying, though, is we could still pass this. We could still do what we want to do with the marina and still pass it or not pass it based on um, a discussion next month anyway, not having to wait for the, for the county commission to make that determination because it would Correct. then after... It, it, if it does go to the planning, if it does go to the um, commission, it would no longer be our determination. But in this case, it would still be our determination. Co correct. Right. Correct. Okay. So it could only be possibly be one month. Yes, right. So I would make a motion that we continue date certain for the next planning board meeting. Second. We have two motions. But you wanted yeah, to say would, something. Well, so there's a motion on the floor. I don't know if I can. <laughs> Jump yeah, in on this. Open but, discussion, man. All right. Yeah, it's, it's uh, my question is, you know, I thought we were coming here to work on the definition of the marina, the amount of spaces per acre for a dry storage, for boat slips, all the working parts to determine what would work, not in this particular area, but in the county as a whole. So, you know, we're talking about one project, but we're trying to 
come up with an idea as or myself as a planner to determine what is the best way to achieve that in all of Flagler County. So I don't understand why we're punting for another month when we can have a discussion now on how many acres, how many parking spaces, the heights, the setbacks. I don't understand why we can't have that discussion tonight. We, we will be having we'll that be is having on our that. agenda. So maybe I, well, then I'm So we're just continuing that that's a byproduct of this application. So if we make this determination, let's say we didn't and correct me um, either of you Sean or if I'm wrong, if we make the determination and don't continue this tonight, just go ahead with this item tonight and make a determination one way or other. If we were determined for instance that it was allowed, um, there is no definition and then we don't have any particular rules. All right, so we're working it. on the definition and the parameters for allowing a marina within well, Flagler County. Within, right, and, yes. and the definitions that if you see in our packet that he has, he's got three different types of marinas and different, so, you know, there, it's a more broad discussion than just this item. But it would seem to be if we can get some more clarity on what a marina looks like in this county and whatever, right, so we then we do, would know better, does it fit into a C2 zoning? Right, so that's what to, we're doing tonight is that portion. And yes, we're still we doing that. on that, then we come back in a month. Correct, but we, but Press. as I was just okay. uh, informed, we don't actually have to wait to make this determination for that applicant, but at least having that better understanding where this is going would be probably logical than yeah. kind of making I, it the I blind. can agree with that. Thank you. So, Mr. Langella, can you um, call your motion again, and then is, would that be? Well, if we have any more discussion, then we call for a vote. Do we have any more discussion? Would anyone like to make a motion? Can, excuse me? To continue application 3257, to the August Planning and Development Board meeting. Okay. And I do have a second on that motion. Okay. Um, all in question, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any nays? All right, the motion passes unanimously. So now we start our discussion, correct? Yes. If if we did, we did discuss changing the order. Right. Um, to so talk we're, about we're, the marinas. We're gonna, we're gonna start with number 5C, yep. the marina discussion, and then we'll go to uh, discussion uh, item 5A, and then if we have time, we'll go to 5B. We'll wait for Mr. Langello to come back to start discussing. We, we can, yeah, I can. Uh, I can. I can mention some uh, from what I put into the into the packet. And um, so what I what I've done is, and and you've added a couple of handouts that have also been presented. Uh, some related to the the previous application, the letters that you had received uh, from the planners, but then also uh, along with that uh, uh, parking uh, analysis two pager that was. Uh, submitted by Mr. Bayer and and uh, on behalf of his his client, and I'd say that's that's germane to our discussion here. And then also a, a write up from uh, I think that was from the Kamek Community Association that you saw. Uh, that was also here. That was not part of the packet. Uh, sent also by email, and so that was uh, four total pages uh, uh, and stapled for you to to check out. And and so. Uh, it, what I what I looked at, and probably first what I looked at was the the definition of marina from Florida statute, and that may be the the spot to to head in because, you know, I'll I'll tell you early on, you know, this started out as as you all know was as a as a dry stack boat storage, and so that was that was the discussion, uh, the the uh, the application that had come in the that. And so I, I wasn't exactly tuned into the idea of a marina, but then when you look at our guidance that's here in, in Florida, it, it has a dry component. Marina means a licensed commercial facility that provides secured public moorings or dry storage 
for vessels on a leased basis. A commercial establishment authorized by a licensed vessel manufacturer as a dealership is considered a marina for non-judicial sale purposes. And the citation there from Florida statute. And so that, that to me is the, is the first spot. And, and then I, I looked at the, the parts that I, I know in my world and so that you know, the definitions that I had and, and much of this is from uh, the background that we have. American Planning Association puts out something, uh, different items, planning advisory service. And so these definitions that you saw in the, in the backup, uh, boat livery, boat slip, uh, boat yard, marina, several definitions there, including some Florida examples. Uh, I think you saw Indian River County uh, mentioned several times here. Let's see if I can go to that one specifically. Uh, well, let's see, boat yard. Um, and then you have see also port, harbor facility, harbor facilities, shipyard, premise or site using an industrial establishment. This is the boat yard. The provision of all, uh, all such facilities as are customary and necessary to the construction, reconstruction, repair, or maintenance and accessory sale of boats, marine engines, or marine equipment, supplies, or services of all kinds, including but not limited to rental of covered or uncovered boat slips, dock space, or enclosed dry storage space, lifting or launching services. The term boat yard shall include marinas and boat liveries. And, um, and so that, that as an example uh, for, for you from, from Indian River, and I think I included that uh, elsewhere there. So you, you've got a, a, a few uh, quick definitions that are there. I've included also in the packet the, uh, some companion regulations and, and with a, a leaning towards parking requirements. And, and so that just what we discussed, if we, if we did this thing, if we said that marinas were analogous to something that's in C2 because of the SICK or because of the NAICS, then, then the obvious question is, is, okay, we've had no standards that apply to them. You know, we, it, particularly parking, we don't single out other uses particularly. We don't come in and say, well, if you want to have a daycare center, it can only be one story and it can be 2,000 square feet. We don't say that. But we do say a daycare center has so much, I think we actually don't say that for a daycare center. I think we just say one space for 200. But uh, 200 square feet of, of gross uh, floor area. But the, the, the requirements there are, are lacking for marinas specifically in our, in our regulations. I'll admit this out loud too. When you're talking about this, we, we had that in, in intercedence of, of, of warehousing, commercial warehousing, mini warehouses has been something that you know, is not exactly the, the clearest part in our code. We've, we've, uh, we do have them show up in C2. We have some mention in there, I think, of industrial. I, I, you know, we got other parts that are out there, but again, this, this and, and you don't have something for parking for many warehouses, I guess is what I'm dancing around. And so we've come back uh, as an example, we've a, applied then uh, a standard for the commercial office component. Uh, you'll have, uh, and I pass it out to each of you, uh, uh, a section from Mr. Million uh, that he had on his analysis. That was a one-pager that I, I had that talks about the parking uh, requirements. And so it, I think we're really kind of driving home on, on parking being that one exception I can point out, that if it's not specifically listed in the code for that specific use, then, then there's problems there because then you're coming to that generalized all other commercial one per 200. You end up in a situation when you have something that's seldomly used or occasionally used of, of having major over parking that you're gonna be requiring. Our, our requirement again being a minimum parking requirement for minimum off street parking, always gonna be paved except with that asterisk there that says the, was it fewer than 10? In, in Scenic A1A we can have shell uh, but that that's been that that mix that we've had before is that 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 how do you how do you come up with that balance uh, and if you if you made that determination alone on the c2 and said that marinas are analogous we're, we're missing that parking component more than anything else and so that's why i've got this feel throughout this of you know why, why am i beating the drum so hard about the parking i want to be able to tell you that one jurisdiction has one to three slips one has one to five uh, one may have one per 200 or something close to that for a commercial component and then have something else figured for the, for the, uh, the, the stack operation, the marina operation. Uh, also, just for, uh, I guess, full disclosure, it's come up before, just to make sure I mention it, we have uh, Yacht Harbor Marina, I think is the one that's the, at the base of the bridge. So that has a, a, I think it's, last time I checked, I think it's got a live aboard component that's there. So you already have a marina in unincorporated Flagler County. That's in our jurisdiction. 
uh, that was part of a planned unit development. How did that happen? It's part of the PUD. Uh, full disclosure again, our impact fees, you'll hear it mentioned if you haven't heard already, our proposed impact fee ordinance that's coming forward lists marinas as a permitted use, as a use at least, I, mean, I don't want to say permitted, as a use that has an impact fee tied with it. And so a little bit of weirdness there. We don't have it allowed anywhere in the Land Development Code, but we have it listed in our impact fee ordinance as far as a traffic generation, a transportation impact fee generation. Uh, it, again, happenstance. We didn't plan it that way. It just happened. Our consultant was looking at it and going, well, probably, well, why don't you have it? And, and so, you know, now maybe we're catching up with some of that. Uh, historically, You've heard Matt mentioned also, you've had these boating related operations. I don't want to call them marinas. Again, me being maybe the last one to convince that this is a marina. When I look at a marina, I'm typically thinking wet operations. But you've had these before that are present in the county. We've had boating related operations. We've had, uh, I guess, even going back to the turn of the century and the establishment of Flagler County, on Dead Lake, you had you had some some water related, water dependent uses, is how you'll hear this also mentioned. But we had that history then, not to name them, but not only the facility that we talked about previously, but then there's I think at least two others that are on A1A that had had this kind of historic operation that had been associated with it, some kind of marine related operation doesn't mean that they should continue if, and as our code would say now, that those would be non-conformities if they're not otherwise provided for and those would go away. One of them I think is, uh, is part of Jose Park uh, uh, PUD, I think that had come up, I think that was the, the development name and that that has since expired. So that will have yet another life that may come forward when and if other development happens and it advances forward in another form. Um, that, the reason why I'm mentioning that is because I also had a eureka moment and I pulled it up here if you had seen it. Uh, in the last few months, our, marine, our manatee protection plan also is a resource for this of all things where it lists specific areas in, in, the, in the county where we want development of marinas of water dependent uses to occur. And so the idea then is, are you in areas where, marine, where manatees congregate? Are you in areas where they're, they're uh, uh, mating, where, uh, 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 where, those, where, where they're, they're sensitive, where basically we've had some, some deaths or manatee strikes? And so you have that bit of history that's there and that in, in preparing the manatee protection plan, we identified specific areas where we would want water dependent uses to be allowed in the future. And our manatee protection plan for everyone wanting to look at it, go on to Google, type in Flagler County Manatee Protection Plan, and you'll see where those areas are located. I don't wanna, again, make this specific to any geographic area, but there are areas of the county, specifically in, on the intercoastal, where we say these things should go, where marine type uses should go. And, and so that I'll, I'll single that out and say that those may end up being residentially oriented wet slips. They could end up being some dry component. They could end up being something commercial. The Manatee Protection Plan does not make that distinction. With that bit of a convoluted preamble, I took that, I took the definitions, I took some of this other language, and I took the guidance that I had gotten from our previous administrator, Mr. Cameron, and his uh, objective of having this this three-tier approach and and I crafted this and, and maybe inaccurately I'll take responsibility for the the problems with it all of the good things about it are all his his thinking and and definitely don't want to come back and and uh, tarnish his legacy here in Flagler County with what I've done wrong but I've, I've developed something here that uh, first the definition that I've come up with um, and, and these are all subject to change any structure or combination of structures other than a single residential dock or slip located on or over the water surface of navigable waters or on land adjacent to navigable waters and which is designed or used for the mooring or storage of watercraft, marinas are classified in the following subcategories. You know, you'll see Palm Coast throughout this because I, I used quite a bit of their language and so that uh, I, I did borrow heavily. Uh, but I, I wanted to have the intent here with this was, was three tiers of types of of marina facilities. The first one being something that 
is of a, of a, a lower impact, typically a residential type uh, 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 kind of classification, not something that would be regulating your own dock in your backyard, but something that would that would be your 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 first level, you know, not something that's generating necessarily income, but it's providing more of an amenity. Your your uh, limitations there, at least three, not more than twenty five. Again, nothing set with that. Uh, private recreational leisure pur purposes, uh, non commercial. Uh, maybe we'll have some f uh, limitation five day use boats, uh, day use docks or slips uh, that would be permitted, so that you you could have some visitors, some guests that would come in. Effectively, those are your your extra parking spaces in your residential development that allows your folks to come and visit you. Uh, and we'd have this in any residential zoning district and PUDs, um, any of our PUDs. Uh, dimensional requirements uh, would be uh, limited to any tier one marina, not more than 10% of the total project area or one acre, whichever is greater. Again, nothing set in stone here, but I didn't want to have somebody come in with a tier one marina as a way to subvert any requirement and, and do it as a, a primary principal development. It's supposed to be accessory to something else. Tier two being our first step into a commercial component but here intended to be an accessory to something else. So tier two uh, may be tied to some other adjacent, as we said, rental, commercial, industrial operations, uh, not limited to docking for restaurants, hotels, motels, uh, commercial fishing, charter shipping, sales, that kind of stuff. Uh, wet slips, uh, wet dock uh, space, dry boat storage, all allowed. Uh, again, commercial accessory here. Uh, dimensional requirements limited to 20% of the total area uh, associated with the principal use is what I was thinking on on this one, and then and then geared towards commercial and industrial districts. Tier three being where we have these uses as as a principal use, and that these are of a commercial nature, uh, designed for for income purposes, uh, and for income producing purposes, and that uh, open to the general public for a fee. Uh, you, any combination of wet docks and slips, dry boat storage, could include sewer dump station, boat washing, fueling, limited repair facilities. Uh, ancillary uses include the ship stores, um, and then that boat uh, uh, bait and tackle, food and beverage sales, similar uses uh, may be determined by the planning director. If you want to make it a special exception use, you could come to the, to the uh, planning and development board, or you could define those here. Uh, permitted uses and structures in the C2 and the industrial districts is where I wanted to have it tied to. And then likewise, then your dimensional requirements in the C2 industrial would kick in here. This would become the principal use. It would be another listed principal use in those districts. Hitting on the parking, I've put in here one space per three uh, boat berths, whether those are wet docks or slips or dry storage spaces, they would they would be analogous. And then uh, for your uh, for your other ancillary usage, other commercial uses, the one to two hundred uh, restaurants. If you wanted to have that be something different, we already have that in our code. That, that would default to that if if that's the the objective of the of the planning board. And then you have here um, uh, marina development standards that I, I came up with there that uh, direct access to water of at least four feet at all times uh, so that you do have that wet component. You would have these located uh, adjacent to a water body. And that, that four foot being, uh, I think, minimum for, for somewhat navigable uh, purposes. Uh, all outside storage areas screened from adjacent properties uh, by opaque wall, uh, fence, or planting material being our requirements in Article 5. Uh, separated from any established residential use, residentially zoned property by an un uncompanary land use buffer that also meets the existing requirements of Article 5. And then specific to dry boat storage, I wanted to call those out. Uh, dry boat storage should be constructed consistent with uniform building code wind load standards, including interior sprinkler systems or equivalent fire suppression systems. And then also dry boat storage will be contained within fully enclosed buildings, not including the space needed for forklifts to load the racks. And so uh, with, with that, that's the at least maybe a starting point for us to have a discussion uh, and, and wanted to offer that to you. You've, you've definitely got a, a portion of a record. I'm not going to say it's inclusive of all possible alternatives, all possible options, uh, but I'm hoping that this will be uh, enough for you to be able to take and, and craft into, into what you think would be appropriate. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'll close and wait any questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mangle. Um, board discussion. Can I make a recommendation? I mean, the audience is here, and I would love to hear from the public what they just heard while it's fresh in their mind, and then we could probably talk after hearing everyone's uh, point of view. And you just, everyone feel about that? So we'd be opening this up to public comment. 
for their opinion with a time limit. With a time limit. I mean, this is a board discussion. Well, it, it, we don't have to open to the public comment. We don't have to, but in all honesty, they probably have stuff to offer. And uh, it probably wouldn't be, in my opinion, it wouldn't be bad to hear from people about what they think about this. I don't think we have I would have suggest enough. that after we have our own little discussion and see if we can come to some consensus ourselves and then see how the public feels well, about that it. Would, yeah. Mike, that would probably be at the next meeting when we go to make a motion, if we do one, but at no, least we hear about what the motion. I'm say. talking about the regulations uh, defining uh, marinas. Right. And but we're not making the regulations. All we're doing is giving input, and then Adam will come back next month. So if we hear it from their point of view, and then we can talk about it, when we go to actually make a motion, it'll be next month, they would have digested you know, our, our viewpoint from them and then our own and be able to hear. If, if, we, if we hear from them after we have a discussion, we'll be having a discussion maybe right after it again to talk about maybe what we heard. That's my, I mean, I, I mean, I'm just one person. I just think that if we hear from them, it would be maybe beneficial for us, that's all. Mr. Chairman, if I could jump in. And so maybe I've made everything as confusing, as, as possibly confusing as I can make it because of, with leaving this open-ended dis discussion, anticipating that you're not going to have any specific action on these, that you're going to, you're going to discuss it. I, I'm, my job then is to take what you, what you say here and, and craft something then to return with. But I'd, I'd like to, I'm going to make some, I always do. I make some folks mad and some folks happy, I guess, or maybe just lukewarm. Um, if if I could offer that, I, I, I like the idea of hearing from, I think we've got some folks who could act almost as fact witnesses, not that we're intending to cross-examine anybody here. This isn't quasi-judicial proceeding or anything like that, but I think we've got some folks who could offer some, some, some stuff uh, that could help you with your discussion and so the, in the audience. And so I, I'd, I'd, I'd offer that to you that uh, even even the general public that uh, it uses the waterway, I, you know, I think we can we can get some some good information from them. Okay, well, I'll take your recommendation then, Mr. Mangle, and we'll open it up to public comment. I'd like to comment one thing in regards to the tier one, um, the amount of of watercrafts, the twenty five watercrafts. So that um, that number there would be, and this was tier one. I'm, it's a part of a PUD. So like Yacht Harbor, correct or like Canopy Walk that has boat slips. Um, that number of, uh, or uh, no more than 21, uh, 25 watercraft seems a little light compared to those PUDs. And I mean, there's more than 25 watercrafts in those, in those PUDs on uh, more slips. So I think that number, I think we should like go off of the PUDs that are in place now that have marinas and see what those, their numbers are and and use those numbers as a as a watercraft the amount of watercrafts not and I'm not sure if you did that already or, or not but I think that would be something to to consider so I have a question on to that so if um not more than 25 but if somebody came with a proposal for 30 would that just be a special exception that we could have approve if or is it a hard 25 yeah it, as it's written it's a hard 25 and and so that um, and, and and then I, I could maybe see the, the the problem there because the tier one getting more geared towards accessory to the to the, the a, a commercial type operation getting getting closer to the commercial side of it you know maybe based on what y'all are heading towards I hadn't thought about this but uh, I hate to hate to think of this, but in, in reality, if I'm buying in a development and and I'm on the water, my expectation is I'm going to have a place for my boat. So maybe not to exceed uh, the number of dwelling units within the development, and maybe that's maybe that at least gives you the, a high end on the on the upside of it. I'm trying to think of Yacht Harbor as an example, and not to call them out again as, as specifics, but you know, see if my math would work with the 10 percent and the one acre, and and I think also I'd see there. You know that that's not going to work there either because I think I'm probably upwards of probably a good four or five acres with their their wet marina portion uh, uh, that they have within the development. I think probably a good bit of that at least. And then you also have within that thinking thinking of that um, you have an area that's that's cut out for for the meandering the the maneuvering of the boats. 
And so, you know, not only my slip space, but then I have a much larger area that's needed. Uh, just, just thinking of that, and, and that would be included in the math, I, I would think, as part of the marina, uh, that, you know, that was part of the basin uh, that's there, if you will. So, uh, I'm so well, I, I guess, would we need to have a limit at all? If it's part of a potential PUD or, or a huge neighborhood that gets someday developed uh, somewhere, uh, that would be part of that master plan, I would think. Um, do we need a limit? Because we don't know what the future holds. Do we need? There are some mega communities in Florida with all sorts of boat slips. I don't know how many they have versus how many houses. And, and then when you add towers, like at the hammock, you keep adding more towers, then there's more units, and maybe there's expansion, things like that. I don't know. I mean, it, it, we're, we're talking about non commercial marina. So, what difference does it make if the project gets approved? So do you think there should be a limit or not? I, I'm saying I don't think there should be. It's a, it's not as non-commercial. More than likely, anything non-commercial is going to be a, a a PUD of some sort or a uh, you know right a condo development or or, or a large neighborhood. Um, Maybe a percent like a percentage type approach. And density. it's all going to have to get approved as one big development. I don't know why we're worried about the number of slips. We don't know how big the development could be. I don't know how many slips are in the Yacht Harbor. There's got to be a lot of them in Yacht Harbor. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's yeah. I mean, so. You know, I'll, I'll mention an obvious part maybe here that, uh, Mr. Chairman, if it's all right, that, um, you know, that on the side of, of policing it, you know, when you start talking about preventing uh, occupancy liveaboards, you know, a full, full uh, utility uh, uh, water and sewer electrical connections, you know those those kind of things are. Yeah, I think we can we can do that on a on a practical side. We can regulate that, but I don't I don't know how. I'll admit it. I think it's difficult to enforce, and so not that I'm calling out anyone, but if a if a marina had had that, it would would then have the the effectively you're allowing an extra unit of density, and so if you're you know and and, and as far as maybe that's being leased out. And, and we don't know that. We're not able to track that necessarily. You, I think you can hit some of that and regulate that by having, instead of having full connections, you can have just the pump out, which would, would be kind of a pain to go and move your boat to get pumped out every time. Uh, I could understand the argument for having electrical cook, hooked up to keep everything from, from uh, you know, climate controlled uh, so that you're maintaining your, you know, your, your batteries and all, the, all those things. But uh, uh, as far as utility, uh, full water and sewer hookups, I think you're, you're then uh, gravitating towards allowing those to become liveaboards potentially. And, and so then, you know, is it a concern? Maybe it's not a concern. Uh, but then, uh, you know, then you, you may be boosting a, a yet another uh, unit of density uh, that, that you hadn't accounted for otherwise. Okay. Well, that's just something, you know, bringing to your attention in regards to putting a, a number on it. I think we should consider and, and discuss and or just find out what would be the best approach to to that. Um, so we'll go ahead and open it to, to public comment now. Sound good? Or do you guys want to you have any any other questions or comments before well, we a, open yeah, it up I to have public? A comment. All I mean, right, go ahead, Jack. Public comments, but not related to any particular property, right? Right. Yeah. This so, is this is a public comment. Sucked into that. Yeah. We don't comments. want to go down the 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 rabbit hole of um of talking about specific applications or properties or anything like that for for this. This is going to be strictly based on our uh, our discussion for uh, item number five C. So um, as long as everyone's aware of that out there. We'll go ahead and uh, open to public comment now. If you'd like to come up, we're still going to do the three minutes, right? We'll do a three-minute count for, for individuals and um, state your name, where you're from. If you'd like to come up, now's the time. Mr. Chair, board members, I'm Kathy V, and I live at uh, 5676 North Ocean Shore Boulevard, and I'm also on the, the Hammett Community Association board. Um, have you gotten a copy of this document that we developed? It's called Where Should Marinas Be Located? And it's, uh, I think it was provided to Adam yesterday afternoon by our attorney, 
we would have given it to you a lot sooner, but we thought there was going to be a workshop and we were going to have time to give input and that sort of thing. So unfortunately, that hasn't happened. But one of the very first things, and I think it hits the point of one of the board members, is um, we kind of thought tier three should have more than one tier. Um, it should have one that says a common sense approach to marina dry dock storage, dry stack storage, less than five acres. Because I think that's the struggle that we're all having, is this is a small parcel of property, and it's between residential. You know, there, there may be commercial other places in the hammock, not gonna argue with that, but this is right next to our house. So we think that you should think in terms of big marinas and little marinas, and I'll tell you, we've looked at what's available on the water in the hammock, and there's not a lot of C2. There's very little, actually, that's available on the water to develop marinas. I'm not going to go through every one of these because it'd take me more than three minutes. You'll get a copy of it, hopefully. And uh, I would also point out two other, well, one other document, the city of Palm Coast. If you haven't read their marina ordinance, very good. Has proper setbacks, deals with noise, forklifts, things like that, that if you're going to build something next to two homes, makes a lot of sense. You have proper setbacks, you have noise control. I mean, this type of development belongs in an industrial area. It does not belong in C2. So th those are my only comments. I had a lot more, but I'm going to spare you all tonight and, and ask you to at least look at our document. Excuse me, I have a question on that document, if you don't mind. Yes, sir. Page 204, the building dry stack, dry stack storage building shall have no more than... 15 votes per acre? Correct. Okay, that's what I thought it was a typo, but if that's what... I mean, it's the property's nearly five acres, so... There's I mean, that's what you would property. see, I think. Dry, dry storage, where they stack them, 15 per acre? Correct. Okay. That's, that's what we're suggesting, because it's between two residential areas. I mean, Mr. And Chairman, residential I, all around. I, gotta, I gotta emphasize here. The, 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 this is not a specific property, right? Yeah. And so that uh, we're, yeah. we're, I don't, I don't want to. I'm not talking about any particular property. I'm talking I'm about just item saying, four. You're saying that that anywhere, only 15 boats per acre. No, sir. What I'm saying is, when there's less than five acres, that's what I'm saying, and that's what we said in this document. Um, if it's dry stack storage less than five acres, if you've got a big old piece of property like St. Augustine Shipyard. I've been there, had lunch there, or was, yeah, brunch. Um, watched the boats going out. I was there on Memorial Day. It was busy. Thank you. Good evening. My name's Jody Bollinger. I live at 5648 North Ocean Shore Boulevard. Some of my comments you'll be able to tell are geared more toward the tier three marinas with dry dock, dry dock storage, but some are just for marinas overall. I think, and these are just maybe some things you would think about as you're writing your marina amendment in the future. What I've seen so far, there are no protections for the scenic corridor. They're not addressed at all in anything that Mr. Mingle presented. When the scenic corridor overlay was written in 2004, commercial warehouses were prohibited. A dry stack boat storage building, even though you don't want to call it a commercial warehouse, it is a warehouse structure and it does function as a warehouse. So I would say definitely allow dry stack storage in C2, but not in the scenic corridor overlay. I think you should address forklifts hours of operation, distance of use from a property line, the use of a forklift with a residential sound package should be addressed when, it's a when that forklift is being used adjacent to a residential zoning district. I would ask that a site plan for any tier three marina should be reviewed by not only the technical review committee, but also the planning board, regardless of the size of the parcel. I think a traffic study should also be included in site plan review. All required permits, such as from the St. John's River Water Management District, the Army Corps of Engineers, and the Department of Environmental Protection should be obtained before construction can commence. 
For fuel dispensers, we would ask that you please adhere to NFP 30A, which requires a six foot fence, 10 feet from the gasoline tank and a secure gate. It also requires four inch steel pipes filled with concrete set three feet apart. Our comprehensive plan, E-175, says marinas must provide pump-out facilities or contracted pump-out services. This is in conflict with the draft amendment, which says a Tier 3 marina may have sewer pump-out. Also, the comprehensive plan, E-175, says new or, new or expanded marinas shall not be located in aquatic preserves or Class II waters. Flagler County has two aquatic preserves, the Palisir and the Tomoka. It has class three waters, which um, include the Matanzas River. It runs from the St. John's Flagler County line to south of Washington Oak State Park at mar marker 109. Flagler County is also home to one of only three national estuarine reserve reser research reserves in Florida, the Guanatolomato Matanzas the National Estuarine Research Reserve. Can I just finish? No. Maybe somebody else can finish my script. Good evening again. Dennis Bear, uh, 109 South 6th Street, Flagler Beach. A couple comments. Um, <clears throat> We did submit some comments. This is, I know Adam's been busy lately with a lot of projects and things of this sort. We would have provided more written comments in direct response. Just by way of introduction, I worked with the developers on the Marina Del Palma project where every single family residential got a dry boat store as part of the project. Worked in marinas throughout college and high school and been in the boat building. My father's been in the boat building business for quite a few years after he got out of the Navy. So I'm familiar with a lot of these issues. The, the issue on tier one, um, is it says permitted in all residential and PUD zoning districts. So basically, if I got a single family residence on the intercoastal waterway, I could put in slips, say I'm a nonprofit, and let all my neighbors build slips on that property. I think the intent is, and I worked with a project down in Ponce Inlet, that they have 10 houses in a neighborhood, it comes in for platting, they get 10 docks as part of the platting. But I don't think you want it so every single family residential property would be allowed to have multiple docks as part of that single family. I, I can just envision it getting a little, so I think that needs to be tweaked. The other question on both tier one and tier two, when you talk about 10% of the total project area or one acre or two acres under the tier two, does that include any submerged land leases? Does that include the uplands? Does it include the waterways? What is included in that? Focusing on tier three, as I'm gonna try not to repeat any of the prior comments, I think there needs to be a more defined site plan. What are the navigability components? You're in a high next adjacent to a no wake area or you're adjacent to a high wake area and you're launching directly on your coastal waterway. I think that that is an issue that has to be addressed as part of the site plan. The site plan needs to go to the planning board as pointed out, but under tier three, it allows limited repair facilities. I mean, I used to work in the marinas in South Florida. We'd varnish boats and paint boats and do all sorts of things that probably wouldn't be allowed now Sandblasting was one of those things. So we need to better define what limited repair facilities are under those processes. Boat washing would need to be self-contained so that runoff is not going into the intercoastal waterway. Um, again, I think that it, it needs further definition. The question was brought up about densities. I think there does need to be a, a two tiers within the third tier, one of them saying that, again, under five acres, you're limited. X number of dry slips per acre, and you can have a greater amount over five acres. Again, it comes back to compatibility, and I think that there needs to be more specific targeted compatibility guidelines built in here. Hours of operation of the forklifts has to be addressed. Distance of the fuel tanks, those types of things, those safety considerations need to be part of the site plan review, not just referencing over to Article 5. We'll come up with more comments next month, and we'll get you some more written comments in advance of the meeting. Thank you. Pardon me, sir. We're not. We're not here. Mr. Connor, can you? Yes, yeah, if you. Doesn't the parking space formula by design limit the number of 
uh, slips that you can have in a facility that's under five acres? I mean, if you've got to have a parking space for every three slips at some point, you run out of land anyway, right? That's a component. But if you look at some of the other ordinances from some of the other jurisdictions, they have both. They, they both are addressed. And the other point on the parking, too, is that we think it should be, you know, or I think it should be, can't be shared parking. So in other words, if you have another use on the property, you get a co-count the uh, multiple count the, the parking spaces. Well, this not only that, but in this in this particular the way Adam has this formula structured is if we put an ancillary use, say a restaurant, on the facility, then we've got a space per 200 square feet of gross floor area. We're further limited the number of boat slips. This or doesn't dry allow restaurants just by just by the parking. This doesn't allow restaurants to be co-located. It talks about only talks about um, food and beverage sales. It doesn't say you can co-locate a restaurant on the same parcel. Well, I, I, I hear that. Maybe that's something we talk about. But but what I'm saying is, is the more stuff you put on the property, the more parking spaces you are required to have, and you're limited by design just there. I mean, at what point does a arbitrary five acres or less or five acres or more make any difference? And I'm not, I'm not saying it doesn't. I just don't understand how that would work. Well, it comes back to the whole how much development are you going to concentrate on one small parcel? If you can spread it out if you've got more than five acres, <coughs> you can have a designated parking area instead of cramming all the parking up next to the buildings. But if you're going to have multiple uses on a property, you've got to have sufficient park. My position, I mean, just my position, you should have sufficient parking for all of the uses and ancillary uses on that particular parcel. Or you're going to have a real logistic nightmare. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Bob Million, um, 17 South Waterview, Palm Coast. Um, I mean this in respect. This is like the blind leading the blind. Um, I'm, I'm not going to say that I'm an expert because I don't like that word. I have designed marinas and developments with up to 3,500 homes. I've done marinas without any homes. All of these questions have very simple answers. I have asked Mr. Mingle, 50 times by email, by telephone. Please let me help you do this. I have reviewed hundreds of Florida land development codes. Okay, specifically, why do you need to define parking? Okay, I had this conversation with Mr. Mingle. He said, let's initially, let's make boat storage permissible within the scenic corridor. I said, no, Adam, that doesn't work. I said, a marina is not really a marina. It's dependent on the type of slip. So if I have a charter boat with 50 people on it, I need one boat slip. So if I park three cars for my one boat slip, where do the other people go? Okay, I've got ancillary uses of, of 200 square feet per car. I put a food service area there that would require 50 square feet far in other areas. So basically, the, the people that are most familiar with the marinas are people like Naples and St. Augustine that have multiple uses in a very dense area. And all of them, take a per type of slip approach. If it's a liveaboard, it's generally one to one, one car per slip. If it's an in-water that's not a liveaboard, it's generally two to one or three to one. If it's a dry slip, it's usually up to 10 to one. I mean, the, some of them are five, some of them are six, some of them are 10. There's one or two guys that are three that don't spread the, the difference between dry and wet. Okay, so all of these, the, the parking, no one wants to build a facility of any kind and not have it properly parked. It's insane. I mean, you can't service any of the people, so you've got a problem. So whatever the uses are need to be defined. The parking for that use need to be defined in, a, in, a, in a, a, an aspect that actually covers the necessity. Okay. So what I'm saying to you guys, if you have questions, I know more about marinas than anybody in this room. I've built them. I've designed them. I've run them. I've written the code. I've talked to multiple people in, in the state of Florida. I've got a, an email here that I sent to the, and I gave this to, to Mr. Mingle, the planning director of St. Augustine. And I said, your marina code's old, your city's old, 
is there anything about your arena code that you wouldn't do? Would you change it? Does it work for you? And he's 10 to 1 on dry slips. He's 3 to 1 on wet slips. But he's also dependent on the number of passengers on a vessel if it's a charter boat, if it's a dinner boat, if it's a shell diving boat. And the only answer, and I'll be glad to give this for the record, the only answer that he came back to me was, and if any, or not. Okay. I, I have a question. And I uh, wasn't sure who to ask for this. I'd like to ask you, um, since you said you know more about marinas, <laughs> what, on this tier three, you read this report here on, on, on this. I've read all this. So on the tier three, limited repair facilities. I'm trying to wrap my head around that. I kind of know what goes on at a marina, but in what boats need, and some of it's extensive, and some is most codes. get you by, but how would you, de how would you describe the repairs, limited repairs on, on, on a marina? Well, the error in what's being done here is that you don't separate a boat yard from a marina, and most codes do. And so one is an industrial use, where you paint and you weld and you pull the boat out of the water and you do work on it. Uh, another is a marina, where the ancillary stuff is cleaning it or maybe it's got an outboard motor and they change the oil or service it. But the, the, the biggest difference is the type of work that is allowed is is a commercial industrial type work, and that goes into a commercial or an industrial area into a boat yard, and it's defined by code. There's there's two different SIC codes. Most jurisdictions have have two land development codes. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, gentlemen, and thank you for allowing me to come. My name is William Jordan. I live at 5572 North Ocean Shore Boulevard, just down uh, from the boat yard. But I understand we're talking about the generic doing a marina in Flagler County on our waterway. I did have a quick chance to look at this agenda item uh, prior to coming here. And there were a couple things that struck me. In the draft amendment text, there were many references for other counties and locations, none of those had a date on them or a reference document associated with them. The date is important to me because the scenic A1A corridor was the overlay came into effect, I believe it's 2005. So things ch changed in 2005. One of the documents on a previous agenda item talks about five marina projects um, within a 6.2 mile corridor of this scenic A1A corridor, of which there are really only four. They were mistaken. They counted one of them twice. But um, of those items cited, all of them were from uh, 1996 and earlier. So for example, the dry stack storage that was at uh, 5478, that was in 1996 and earlier, and it was only for 24 boats. So those things need to be looked at. It addressed the Flagler Beach and Palm Coast regulations. Well, both of those have marina, apparently, regulations, but I get in my boat, I go down A1A, I go south of the Hammock Dunes Bridge. One of their marina projects has been vacant for as long as I can remember. I go down to Flagler Beach. The Mr. Sklar project is a, I mean, it, whatever's going on with all that, those things have not been well-developed or well-maintained. They are not anything positive to our community. And that's what we are looking for, I think, for those of us that live in the hammock and those of us that are concerned about Flagler County is developing a proposal that will bring in things that are a positive to our community, not a giant thing that doesn't fit with our community. And one of the, one of the things I will uh, bring up is the Publix grocery store. If you're in the hammock, you, you can go down A1A and go by Publix and not see it. And, and that is a way that the community has come together with the county, developed code, and put in things that are a positive aspect to our community instead of a detriment. And I appreciate your time. I think Mr. Millian's um, points, uh, a lot of the things he brings up, the, the neighborhoods he brings up, the distance from the coast, uh, we don't, uh, how far are we from an inlet to the ocean? It's, every, every community is different and every community has unique constraints and that's why we are here. We need to make constraints that are good for our community. Thank you for your time and effort.
Good evening, Greg Blasse, President and CEO of the Palm Coast Flagler Regional Chamber, uh, here to speak tonight about the, uh, the economics of uh, marinas and to share with you some of the uh, things that I found when I went around the community and started talking to uh, marine businesses, marine industry businesses. And the first thing they said was, you know, that they could not believe that the county didn't have a definition to define marinas. I mean, it was to, to them shocking. Um, I asked them, uh, is there a demand for this? And they shared with me that there was, in fact, a pretty large demand. Um, oh, the screen's moving. It's not me. Sorry, I was freaking out. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that there is a demand for this, and they cited kind of boat sales and how if you showed up to a boat dealership today and paid cash, you might not actually get your boat until six to nine months from now. Um, and we have a waterfront community. So I think in general, should marinas be defined? Yes. Um, what I saw come out from, from the county in the draft text I thought was thoughtful. I thought it's obviously that it adheres to some of the state guidelines that we've been using. Uh, I think that it is similar to what we're seeing at some of the surrounding communities in our region, and I think it puts us in a position to be competitive in this area. And so for me, um, that's ultimately what I'm interested in, is not any one single development. It is kind of to what the last guy said, you know, if we're going to do this, let's, let's do it the, the right and the best way that we can. And one of the things that I was thinking about, and I'm definitely not an expert here, so take that, but... Um, parking, this parking issue that we're, we're talking about, I, I feel like that will be a, a big key to this, and you heard Adam reference that earlier. I don't know what the answer is, but what I would like to prevent is a gigantic empty parking lot that never has cars, similar to pretty much a lot of the places we go to shop and, and use resources. Um, but I also get that we don't want traffic overflowing onto A1A. So I think, to me, the, the parking issue is going to be key to this, but I want these marinas to be successful when they come here. And I don't want them to have to limit their success because of parking spaces, if that makes any sense. So um, the chamber supports what you have in front of you to move forward. I think there are some tweaks, but we can make that through the process and uh, we would like to see it advance this evening. Thank you for your time. Anyone else? All right, well, we're going to close public comment then. More discussion? Anyone? Yeah, I, I got some, uh, I've got some questions or comments. You ready for me? I'm ready for you. On uh, tier one, Adam, can we go back up? Yes, sir. So it appears that the way you've got this structured is the dimensional more requirements are 10% or one acre, whichever is greater. And then you've got a maximum of 20% in tier two. So uh, sh shouldn't that be 10% or one acre, whichever is less? Or am I missing something? So you'd have to have a 10 acre parcel before you reach 10% at one acre. Yeah, we talked about this. And I'm trying to think of what I what my math was. It wasn't because uh, we were we were saying the minimum on a PUD was five acres, and so you're. So yeah, which would put you at you know an acre at to five is twenty percent. Right, somewhere there in my head's exploding. But if if, if you're having, I, I'm 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 good with it if it's. Um, if we wanted to make it 20%, that's that's fine. I mean, if if, if that's where we're heading, I, I was trying to put in some qualifier that that limited. I, I think based on our, the discussion we've already had, I don't think that was really something that y'all were even interested in anyway. So I don't I don't want to burn brain damage on that. If we're going to have instead of limiting factor of being uh, one one space per per maybe dwelling unit uh, that's going to come in there, we'll you know we're we may we may far exceed land area anyway. Okay. When, when I look at, at Tier 1, what comes to mind is Hammock on the River, where you've got seven boat slips in a neighborhood of seven lots, and, and that seems to fit this. My question is, if we look at Yacht Harbor Village, or we look at Canopy Walk, which I believe either or both of those have more than 25 slips, how would we qualify a development like that 
under this ordinance in the future because they don't fit tier two or tier three, and it looks like they would be excluded under tier one by a maximum of 25 slips. So is there a process in this process to allow a canopy walk or a Yacht Harbor Village to be built in the future? Quick answer is, as this is drafted now, uh, no. That the Yacht Harbor uh, closest it would probably come to would be like a tier two. Uh, and that, again, is dependent on the, the accessory uh, commercial or industrial operation. So you're, you're heading towards your commercial that, um, and, and, and I'll say that, I, I think to counter one of the public comments that was made, you know, it did emphasize here a residential PUD district special exception. PUD doesn't have special exceptions, but residential would. And so your, you know, your residential, you, it wouldn't be by right you'd be able to do this. The thought would be special exception that you'd have there. I, I don't know much about Canopy Walk. I think that's in the city of Palm Coast, isn't it? And so I can't really tell you too much about that. Um, I, I'm, I'm shooting from the hip here going, sure, I, I don't think, um, if it's over 25 watercraft, the limiting right now in tier one would be no more greater than 25. And I think we've already kind of beat that horse to death that you know we're gonna do one per one on the on the residential units and call that done as long as it's got a non-commercial component. And I think I'm, I'm comfortable with that. Except if you had on a single, it was brought up, uh, Mr. Bear brought up about a single residential lot and all of, I mean, how do you, how do you do that? If it's a single, if it's not associated with a PUD, so, so it's. Um, so how do you if it's not if it's not associated with a PUD or these all have to be associated with PUDs or or some form of that? Yeah, sing, single residential lot would be uh, I think under under the and maybe I'm not answering it but under the definition of marina single residential dock or slip, hopefully would would be all you're having on a single residential lot, and so then you're you're not a marina then you're but if if you're intending you to have in here though. Say it again. On all residential and PUD zoning districts, I, I think I think that would be up to the discretion. Then, of the, I, I, my quick answer is that's uh, so you you're, may you're have in, to in special exception because, world. Then, because, because, I, because it, to me, I read it maybe as he did that you're allowing this to happen on a single. I have a, a single lot out there, and I'm going to make one of these nonprofit boat slip things out there and kind of. You know, so maybe, wow. maybe here's my here's my devil's advocate thing. I guess is where I, where I could head with it. So I've got enough waterfront there. I happen to really like boats. Instead of collecting classic cars, I collect boats. Uh, it says wet slips or dry storage for at least three watercraft. Doesn't mean it's it's my neighbors. It doesn't mean it's a multifamily unit that I have on my single residential lot. You know, uh, you know I'll offer that up if if I happen to want to have four wet slips on my on my lot then i'm i'm tier one i think i'd come in and apply for a special exception there non-commercial uh, i'm i'm probably taking more than what ordinarily would happen but man i really like boats and so i'm going to have all four of them sitting in the water and so i can take out so we should give some guidance to that as a special exception though then it would I, be I think for, you could do that you know yeah yeah uh, I mean, I, I I know of properties along A1A that that have that are sitting on an acre that have uh, two to three wet slips on them, and you know, but and and it and it and it fits the property fine. So and so here, if you have, if you're three, you're 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 okay. Um, although I I mean I'll say that the inconsistency there at the top mar marina, other than single residential dock or slip, so I'm already failing that definition. I'm I'm a marina as soon as I put in my second second cut for my second boat because I really like boats, and so now I'm a marina. <laughs> I think we can work on that. Yeah. Uh, Adam, looking at the tier three structure, um, have you run any rough calculations? Can you tell me if I use, because I'm, I'm still struggling with this, it looks to me like the parking is going to limit whatever you do, and that, that's consistent with all of the commercial development that I'm aware of. I got a 2,000 square foot building I've got 2,000 square feet of parking. I've got 2,000 square feet of turnaround lanes. I've got 2,000 square feet of access lanes. And by the time I put all that 2,000 square feet added to each other, I've taken up my entire uh, lot. And I'm thinking that's what happens here. If, if we did nothing but build dry storage boat berths under this formula, do you know how many berths we could put when we talk about? When we've got the access lanes, the, the uh, stormwater retention, 
the setback requirements, the landscaping requirements, the, the turnaround areas, the parking areas, and all those things figured in. Can you tell me how many boat berths I could actually construct on one acre of property? Have you run that calculation? No, and, and, uh, and your height limits would, would be a factor here. So you do have different, different height limitations between C2 and the industrial districts. And, you know, and I can't quote that. I think you've had testimony from Mr. Million on, on the heights you'd need in order to, to store those boats. And I want to say, what was it, 15 feet or 18 feet, somewhere around that. And I don't want to have him come back up. But, you know, for each, if you're imagining that in the dry boat storage, you've got a certain amount of area that you've got to have to be able to handle your, your center console, your, you know, all that stuff that's there, and so that you're not scraping the bottom of the, of the boat above and all that. Um, quick answer, no. I, I can tell you, uh, math I've done before for a parking space, 9 by, tw by 20 is our minimum dimensions, so 180 square feet. And so typically you're running somewhere around 240 square feet of, of, of vehicular use area, the VUA language that we use. And so that's inclusive per parking space, to about 240 square feet. That's your parking area and then your ancillary maneuvering space per per uh, parking space. So it's giving you some, some very rough math on, on that side. Uh, as far as what you'd handle, what you'd expect in a surface lot. Uh, back to your question, though, I have not done the, the math on, on what that would permit on a per acre basis, uh, and I, I could come up with that between the C2 and in the industrial districts based on the height limitations in both of those. It, it, and I, I, I think you know where I'm going with this. I mean, we need a rational basis, not arbitrary decision making. Mm -hmm. that's, our, that's our statutory requirement. And so I, I'm just wondering, you know, and, and, I, and I believe you did the homework. I mean, I see the, the background, the material that you put in here. But unless we do any uh, gross calculations on, on what we're actually talking about in terms of what could fit on an acre of land or some other way to measure rational basis for our decision making, how do we know it's not one space for every five boats or two spaces for every boat slip. I mean, you know, at what point do we, do we lose sight of uh, being able to support a rational basis for the decision making? And I believe I heard you earlier say some of the things you looked at said that, you know, you, you got a space per hundreds of boats depending on the use in the yard. Um, and I guess a shipyard uh, where they're doing mostly uh, repair facilities and those kinds of things, that would make sense. Uh, one per three uh, may make sense too. We're assuming that we've got one out of every three boats in the water at any given time. Otherwise, the parking requirement wouldn't, wouldn't uh, apply to anything. And so on what basis do we determine that one out of three boats are in the water at any given time? I, that, that, that's the struggle I'm having with this. And I'll tell you that rationally, and I think I'm preaching to the choir here, I think everybody would agree with this, is that you know, you're expecting Memorial Day, uh, Independence Day, uh, Labor Day, you know, you're, you're going to blow out your parking at your facility, that you'd expect to have a very high utilization rate then. And it may still not be 100%. You're not going to have all of your boats out. And if you think about it, um, and, and many of these handle their services on a, on a, I'll call it a concierge basis, that uh, you have staff, you make an appointment. Uh, these days of the internet, you would you would go online and, and set it up and say, I'm boat 258 or whatever, and please have it ready 10 a.m., and they'll have it as close as ready to, to that point as possible. Some will even offer it uh, fueled up for you and, and have it sitting there. Fueling is part of that, that service that they provide. And so then you're just there and, and kind of a, a turnkey. You go and you just get your bag of goodies that you're going to take out for the day and you hop into the boat and if you can imagine what happens is the choke point ends up being at the end of the day that you can regulate throughout the day when your appointments are going to happen when the people are going to are going to go out but then everybody's going to come back basically at sunset and so that's when you're you know you're you're, you're, and, and those people have been parked then that whole time you know you've, you've had them using the parking spaces you know, I, I've thought about that. We've talked some about it internally at the department, you know, that we also assume that, you know, and, and how many times if you have a boat, have you gone out there where it's just me and, and my family? 
you know, you're going to open it up to your to your friend, and so he's going to come. And maybe if you got a big enough boat, you're going to have maybe their friends. And so then you've had three cars per per berth. And so there's there's that time when you'll when you'll do that, and and you all will come, and you'll potentially meet here. You know, uh, that that I think those are all things that you need to need to keep in mind. I I don't think I'm exactly answering where you're heading, but. You know, those are those are things I think that we've grappled with internally. You know, in talking about this, the nature of the of the business, as as we understand it, certainly others may have different opinions on it. Uh, I think uh, one to five, you saw as an example, one to three, uh, even like we said, the one to ten for some dry dry boat storage, and and, and I'd say not unlike other zoning uh, uses that we'd have, you don't necessarily plan for the time for the Memorial Day, the Labor Day, the Independence Day. You know, you have that that minimum parking, and then you have some ability for overflow if you can, and so that that's always your goal. You you, you don't want to have more hardscape than you have to have. Thank you. Uh, there might be also another um, thing that you have to look at is how much uh, front that you have on the water. Uh, that makes I don't sense. See that anywhere in here? And that that makes sense for the staging. Yes, sir. Staging. I mean, if you're going to have boats, you know, like you're saying, people are coming back in, you have to have. Let's say you have 100 feet on the water. You don't have enough room. So do we have to, decide, you know, we should think about how much water frontage you really need to be able to do tier one, tier two, to tier three, if that's what you keep. But just having no number at all, I don't think would make sense. Mr. Langell. Uh, uh, on that last comment, though, I think that has to do with if it's um, the wet slips or dry slip. Or if both? it's a, well, I think if dry slip, they, they it may not. First of all, they may drive it in their in their vehicle up there and drop it off. And um, yeah, but you still uh, have to stage them someplace. I mean, let's say, well, for example, it starts raining on the water. Just let's. Yeah, but it may not. Example. But it when may not be the same as it may not time. be the same use. I'm saying. So I think you need to differentiate between dry slips and wet slips if you're talking about waterfront. Okay. So then we it have may to not be the same the same amount of use. But um, you know, we I had several things here. First of all to what you were saying, I don't think we can ever plan and it isn't practical to make any parking lot handle every holiday and, and every possibility of every car showing up for everything. You know, I, uh, we, pass, we, we passed the um, project right by the airport that, that um, Commons or whatever it is, and now they turn it to Palm Coast, okay? Um, and then it's a plan of fitness. Well, I went ahead and joined that gym. And um, luckily it's open 24 hours because there is not enough parking during all the peak hours. Okay, so I adjusted when I go. I go at three o'clock in the morning, all right? So I, I don't, so that's just what's gonna happen in any business. I don't think it's practical to go to a, and if, and if a business wants to have every single person there, like they do at a Walmart, they, the Walmart exceeds their parking. They'll put in a bigger parking lot, that's up to them. If, but I don't think we need to regulate everybody put in the biggest parking lot for a whole bunch of reasons. I think that it's economically not feasible, I think it limits the, the ability of some people of, of doing an operation. I think it makes too much hardscape, bad for the environment. Um, I, I just, so I, I'm not in favor of saying, what is the worst possible scenario for parking? And let's make sure everybody has the worst scenario. So again, I think it sort of self-regulates itself. If, if you, know, you can't have too little and you can't have too much, it's that what's the right amount of porridge in the, in the bowl? Um, there was this, this, somebody passed this out. I'm not sure where this came about, the, the recommended slips, and somebody else passed one over here. But it seemed like when I looked at the, that you, what you had for parking in this um, Tier 3, you took basically sort of like the worst-case scenario out there because you didn't differentiate between the dry slips and the, and the wet slips. And I, and I really think you should. I, 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 they're different. They're not the same as... People are going out there on Sunday, and then people storing them in there. And again, I, I argue that that if it's if 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 the business do, if you, know, you if they have so many people showing up to get those boats out of there, um, it'll self-regulate itself. The people just won't be storing the boats; they can't get them out. If they so, if it's their choice. If they if the full hundred percent capacity is let's say a hundred a hundred, and we regulate and say you need seventy five. And they built it 75 because they, knowing that there could be more they need, I mean, they're in that business, but they only built 75, then they may only get 75% of their business. That's up to them. And, they, and that may work for their performer. But to, to regulate it 100%, I think it's, 
um, unnecessary. Somebody brought up something about um, forklifts with residential packages, and I know we talked about noise and whatever. So is there such a thing? I mean, I know I've seen some forklifts in buildings, like I said, they were light. They use lights instead of noises. They were, you know, inside of buildings. So um, that may be something to look at in in in, in cases where um, marinas or any business may create a noise that is a problem. So that that particular element may not be a problem anymore. If that's their issue, a forklift going out in the middle of the night, um, maybe that's not a bad idea. And I'm not talking about anyone in particular. I don't like the idea of putting in um, an NFPA code or citing that you have to have a sprinkler system. And, and in your examples, there was only one city that did that, I think it was Ponce Inlet. And so you took that one instance and you threw it out there and not that Ponce Inlet is the bastion for all planning development and we should do everything they do. I, I, I would say if, uh, if the, the fire experts who write these codes and the fire marshals and the experts say you need it, that's for the applicant and them to do. We're in planning and not necessarily the building department um, I mean, you may be, but um, the building department or the fire department. So I, I, I think that particular element should be taken out and let, let the experts fight it out in whatever form and fashion that it is for the day that it comes up. I, I, I think we're delving too far into the rabbit hole when we start talking about elements outside of zoning. Um, sewer pump out. So why would we not in a tier three, why don't we ask for sewer pump outs in tier, in tier three? I mean, does that make sense? To, would if if they don't have that facility there, are they going? Is it is? I mean, this is a question, and anyone for anyone, does that mean that somebody could be dumping illegally out there because they'd have nowhere to dump, and we're we're allowing them to park and they're dumping? So, is you know, I would ask to find out if that necessarily is something that we have to look at. If a if a sewer pump out is should be mandatory in in that kind of a zoning. Um, we already, I already brought up about the multiple slips on, on an acre, and I, I think your point is well taken. So if you can have a residential lot and you want to have a bunch of boats, but I think you should differentiate the way you wrote it because it was, to me, unclear. Um, it, maybe it's for your use or the use of the owners or whatever versus um, community use or whatever. I think because I think you're, you're kind of crossing lines there without doing that. Um, the limited re repair um um, functions. So uh, that may make sense as well. So do you turn a what seems to be an innocuous marina into a, almost a shipbuilding yard because they're out there and welding and, and grinding and you know just doing an excessive amount of work which may be seem to be industrial. So I think there might be something to look at that. I don't know if that's something you can regulate and something that you could write a language to. But me, for one, I think that sort of made sense. Um, and the hours of operation, I don't, uh, I, I don't know if that makes sense to regulate that. I don't know. I don't know how anyone else feels about that. But I don't know if you can. I mean, what do you do? The, the boats are sitting out there coming in because they were, came up from Miami and they got held up because the drawbridge was down, and now they're they show up at um, you know at midnight and the place just closed at eleven thirty and. And now they're sitting in their boat all night and with no sewer pump out when <laughs> and uh, making a mess out there. Um, also, the 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 idea that that these are in C2 or I districts. So do we have any industrial districts on a waterway? Because you already made that a provision, which made sense. It has to be on a waterway. And by the way, no one seemed to argue with your paragraph in the beginning, which defined the boat slip, and you used some of the language from the um, from the state licensing board. But as you said, you didn't clearly define it in there. But it, but it was in there that they do have a dry storage component. I think that sort of puts to bed whether or not a marina has that or not. So, um, but do we have any industrial districts on the water? Not, that would not presently. Not presently. So, well, do we have any in our um, future <laughs> land use map? Okay, so we don't have anything there. So that's we, the, we did, and so let me, let me mention that, though. Um, you know, and think about it, going the way back machine. You know, remember the whole area there in the Sea Ray Basin? And you know, you've heard me preach about that before, where we took the industrial off the map, and along with everybody else in northeast Florida, because we said, oh, we don't need that industrial. Houses are what we, what we need to be growing. And so remember the history, we took all that away. 
And so, you know, presently we, we um, I, I can't think of any, uh, it, it was all right there is where it was. And so it's, it's all off the map now. Other I mean, than the former Sea Ray site. Yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, I, I personally don't industrial. mind seeing that, that's the industrial. That's right. And it's still, Sea Ray is still in our jurisdiction for the moment. I, I don't mind seeing industrial in this, but I didn't know if we had any. So in effect, it's there just in case something almost impossible ever happens. But we're really talking about C2 when we're talking this. This is, this is pretty much, because since there is no industrial nor none planned in our future land use map, this is really all C2. But, yeah, right. So, yeah, so I just don't want to get confused yeah. with the concept that we're showing it in an industrial, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a definition with no, with no place to go. I'm, I'm always hesitant to say never, say never, but uh, I'm, I'm following you that right now, you know, with the future land use map zoning, what it is, we're predominantly talking about the C2. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine what the public outcry would be if we decided to go on the water and start making industrial land anyway. Put it back. Yeah. You mean? So this is really a C2, <laughs> a C2 issue. Um, is there is there anything we're talking about? You didn't bring anything up in here, but about the landscaping and all that. So is all that just follow the regular landscaping? Yeah. So that that was the language I had in there about to do what's in Article Five uh, of the Land Development Code. And so you had the the buffering, uh, the uncomplimentary buffer that's there. Don't create anything different. And so if 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 you feel that something extraordinary needs to be in here, and it seems like we're we're probably heading towards that, then then prescribe something. You know, if we if we want to treat these special, 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 then let's do it. Well, is there any problem with more impervious or more pervious parking with the area that may have, I mean, if you look at the Bing's Landing, which is a public facility, I don't know how much impervious parking we have. The whole thing is virtually, you know, allowing water to drain to the ground. Yeah, but very, very so little. So if we're doing it there, and, and that's a very similar operation, and that's been after the adoption of our planning codes, that's done after that. You know, it seems to me that, you know, to have some element, some percentage of parking to be pervious versus impervious would help with use of land and, and environmental too. I mean, we're not, it, to, to, uh, I know in another item where there was a, a suggestion that parking in general be in one district, um, be opened up more to impervious. But again, I, I just think that that would be make more sense so maybe look at that too. Thank you. Going down the line here. Boy, did you have anything? No, you didn't. Setbacks uh, as it's listed right now in tier three would be according to the zoning district. Uh, that was at least the intent. I believe your microphone is. I believe your microphone is muted. Setbacks in, in regards to residential. I mean, if you have another commercial facility next to you, that's not you know. But if you have a residential, what would the setbacks? Be? So tier one. Um, I'm quick talking, answer. I'm talking tier three, which is a much bigger. Tier tier three, it wouldn't be allowed in residential. So if if you're. Um, I'm not talking in a. All right abutting a residential properties. The article, article five's uh, uncomplimentary buffers there, and I'm trying to think of what rules are that um, you know, they're, they're not big. And so, yeah, I think 50 feet, I think is what you ordinarily, but that, that's actually, that's not an article five. That's a, that's a thing that comes in with the scenic A1A overlay that I remember, and I think it was RC. Which it when is it, in article five. Okay. Um, your uncomplimentary land uses. For existing the residential. buffering is, through the landscaping requirements. Yes, sir. I would suggest looking at making that a little bit uh, longer setback. Mike, let me ask you a question. So sure. again, we talked about this being that this ordinance is pretty much gonna fall only in a C2 area because we don't have industrial. That's what I was saying earlier. So in a C2 area, we can have shopping centers and a lot of high traffic, high noise and heavy you know restaurants the whole nine yards gas stations and whatever what would make it any different from from a marina for both noise and cars and traffic what would make it any different in here why would we make a bigger buffer? Uh, so what are the present setbacks for commercial towards residential 
I mean, whatever it is in that zoning district, if like if it's good for the goose, good for the gander. So my question is, what's the whatever we have in there? I don't know what that. I don't memorize my genus does. I'm sure <laughs> <laughs> she thinks about this at night. I believe there is also now. Remember, setbacks are just structures, and I believe that there is a larger setback when you have an, a, a zoning district, a commercial district abutting a residential. Mm -hmm. I believe there that's is. in the C2. But the buffering, I believe, was where you're headed, Mr. Goodman, is... is no, I was heading towards... You want a greater distance. No, I, not that I, what I want. It's just I was curious what the answer to the question was. Okay. Now go to, go to C2, please. Okay, I was going to go on, on complimentary is where I said, but all right. Fifty feet. So. The minimum required side or rear yard shall be 100 feet where they abut a residential classification. So that's where you've got the C2 abutting a residential. And that's your, that's your, the rear. That's your shopping center section and then. Right. right. And then your general commercial on an individual site, your rear yard is 10 feet and less abutting residentially classified and then it's 35. And then, yeah, and then scenic A one A, you do have differing requirements just just for the folks there, and so you've got shopping centers, interior lot, fifty feet when adjacent to residential zoning district uses, ten feet when adjacent to commercial zoning. This is that fifty foot that I was mentioning that I thought I remembered in R in uh, and I said in R C, and then you come down, oop, not that far down, but your um, your C two then for general commercial has similar language. This is specific to the scenic A1A, 50 feet adjacent to residential zoning, 10 feet when adjacent to non-residential zoning districts or uses. Uh, we make, we're making up now a new classification, correct, for marinas. So within that classification, it would fall under a 100-foot setback? Your, or would it fall under your a 50-foot setback? Marina's not a shopping center. C2. Yeah, yeah, I'd say marinas would fall into your general commercial, so they'd either be, you know, they'd, they'd, they'd either be here, your non-scenic A1A, uh, rear and side yard 10 feet unless abutting any residentially classified uh, property, then 35 feet, and then, or you're, you're down here under A1A, um, you're 50 feet when adjacent to residential zoning districts or uses, 10 feet when adjacent to non-residential zoning districts or uses. Okay, thank you. We're only talking about side yard here. The rear yard is the river. Right. Remember, you're talking broadly. So, but I, I get what you're saying on a one on a one a specific to these on the west side of a one a. I understand that. I think that was the point I was making earlier. Was when you figure these setbacks and the access lanes for the emergency vehicles and the turnaround lanes to access the parking area and the minimum parking requirements, you're, you're limiting by that formula that all the code provisions included the number of slips that you can do. And if you want any wet slips along the river, you limit it even further. And so this formula for me works. I, my, my problem, as I said earlier, was I just didn't know what, where we get it from, but I'm, I'm seeing information here now that it's kind of shooting the middle of what other cities have done. So I, I, I guess I can presume rational basis. I don't think he went in the middle. He was more on the conservative side. Adam, would you agree with that? I, I, I think it could be argued. I mean, the, 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 I saw others at one to five. I thought one to three, you know, and, and I understand what you were saying about the wet versus the dry, and I, I appreciate that. You know, I think there is a distinction needs to be made there, but I was I was trying to lean towards the one to three I thought was more conservative. You know, I, I, I was, you know, I, 
I, I, I think we even had the one to ten out there as, as a generator, and, and I, I was hoping that was going to be a, a more of the middle ground. But I, I'll admit that the one to three, by design, inclusive of the wet and dry, you know, that was that was a little broad brush. And, and uh, I understand your comment. I appreciate where you're heading with that, of, of having something different. Parking is really going to dictate the amount of slips a warehouse or facility is going to be allowed. That's going to really, it's all going to come down to that, which is good. It makes it easy. You know, well, in, in the context of locating uh, a marina on a commercial property, that's surrounded by residential. See, that's the difference is you get these 50 foot setbacks when you've got to buffer yourself between the residential. It's built in by design. It's like where my office building is. I mean, I'm surrounded by residential. I was required to have extended setbacks on the side and the rear and in the front setback along A1A quarter. I can tell you what you can put on a half acre under that criteria, 2,000 square feet of office space because the time you make room for the fire truck and you make room for the turnaround and you make room for your parking and you make room for backing up to get out of the parking and you put all that stuff in the rear of the building and you do all the compliance required uh, by the scenic overlay, um, it's all you can do. A half acre is 2,000 square foot building and it doesn't matter how tall you get, 2,000 square feet is 2,000 square feet. And so um, I, I'm thinking that the formula works if what we're trying to accomplish is making sure that residential areas are protected and also limiting the size of the facility within a given space. I, I hear Mr. Baer's argument about, you know, we ought to have a criteria for less than five acres versus more than five acres and that sort of thing, but I'm not convinced that that's true. I think with the parking formula and the setback requirements and all the things that are built into this, if we have to, a marina located on a piece of commercial property that's surrounded by residential, our code already has the buffers built in and we're limited by design. Then in reference to, um, in regards to the wake area and those, those locations, so is that, is that something that I mean that's good. It's important. It, it, that that to me is is it's it's behavioral. I mean it, it's not a we, we don't presently that I know of we don't sell somebody that you can't put a residential dock there because you're in a no wake zone. It just means that when you're operating your boat you can't produce a wake. So I I don't I don't really know what why that's relevant here. For, I'm not trying to be be smart it. about it, but it's just if. You know, and, and I get it. We're not trying to create a problem for law enforcement either, but that's um, it, it's a it, it's an operational aspect. It's not a it's not a restriction on on the on the on the placement of a facility. Maybe I'm wrong. The, okay. Who decides on the no wake zones? Is it the inland water navigation people or? The state if, or the if county. I'm, if I'm remembering, at least in context of the Manatee Protection Plan, it was dictated, okay, by us, right? By DEP, uh, really, you can read that into it because it was related in that context to Manatee deaths, our, our history there, and, and you know, definitely where, you know, calving, where the birthing happens and where, you know, the, all of the Manatee areas are. And so, uh, the best I remember, it was, it was, uh, Maybe it was DEP or it was, it was um, uh, yeah, DEP. I thought, I thought yeah, for some reason I'm thinking fish and wildlife played a role in it also, but it was, it's a, it's a, a state requirement, but as I remember, we included it in our manatee protection plan, so in effect it becomes self-imposed is what I'm, what I'm recalling. I'm thinking more on the, on the boater safety aspect of it, like people pulling in and out. And I think there's a. I think I get what everybody's talking about when they're talking about that. I don't want to brush through it. That it's it's the idea that, you know, you, you're obviously adding more boating density 
to an area uh, so that you're having something that's gonna create a concentration of, of, of boats where there isn't one right now. And so that you know, if, if there's already a, a safety issue there that necessitated the no wake zone, then what are you doing then? Obviously, you're, you're making that situation worse by, by putting this concentration there. I, I get what the, the objective is. Is that an issue right now at Bing's Landing? Not, not that I'm aware of. So I, I don't know if it should be an issue. I mean, if it's not an issue there, again, we're, we already have an actual live working facility. And to say that, okay, we're going to come up with something else that, that they're already doing, and, and I think we're probably looking into it too deeply. It's, whatever the Fish and Wildlife um, rules are, any boat has to follow it, and whatever the speed zones and the wake zones. And, and when, like I said, we have a facility right now, and they're launching boats. And, if it has, if it isn't an issue, I don't think it's an issue. Yeah, well, that's a protected basin, also. Right. So that's what I'm saying. So yeah. the, if they, it can depends put a, on if you have a so protected we have a, basin we, or if you're just basically right on the. But we have water. a we have a, a a marina, if you want to call it that, in a protected basin. So to regulate them and say you can't have it in one, we already have one, and it's not an issue. So I'm, I don't think we should limit them not to be in a certain area because we already have it in an area that we would assume not to have it in. Doesn't make any sense if, if we already have it there to say, okay, we can't have another one, but we have it here and don't have any problems. But I know what Mr. Goodman's saying, and I think we can all kind of relate to it, is the uh, the, the idea that you, know, you get you have a effectively a queuing area that's happening out of the, you know, put it back in the trans in the in the roadway context. I've, I've got my off ramp. And so I'm I'm taking that that queuing traffic that happens at sunset you know, when, when everybody's trying to get off the water and I'm, I'm pulling it out of the, the travel lane. So I don't have to, I think that's what everyone's thinking with the no wake zone is that, you know, hey, I got a lot of traffic here, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna reduce the speed down. I don't know if that's necessarily what's happening. I think those no wake zones are more related to manatee incidents right now. Um, and erosion probably too. And, yeah, I think, I think that's correct. I think that's gonna be self-regulated too. A boater um, is not gonna launch in an area where they feel there's a huge wake or it's unsafe. That's just, they're gonna find a better place to do it. Uh, I think canopy walk, right? Those boats are out of the water, but that's not a no wake zone. So when you launch your boat and you can't, you're looking, you, you know, you're seeing what you're up against before you lower your boat in. And uh, if, if somebody builds a marina on the intercoastal, a lot of boat traffic, I wouldn't take my boat there to launch it. I don't go somewhere where there's a protected base and, and do it. So I think it would be self-regulated. Uh, somebody would be crazy to build a uh, something like that along the intercoastal and have it unsafe. That people just won't do business there. Who a boater? I used to be. <laughs> no, I see that when I try to drop my. I won't take my boat out on the weekends because I know I'm just going to get smacked up against. Yeah, certain ramps you won't go to, and this and that, and others you will. Right. And I need to add just so that uh, others who may be out there saying, you didn't mention the width of the channel. And so I want to make sure that there's a component there. I understand that's at play also. Uh, so uh, you know, I, I know there's a lot of moving parts here and pieces to this, but uh, I, I'm not sure how that plays in. Maybe we'll look a little deeper there and see if there's something we need to come forward with also with that. I don't want to be dismissive of any concepts at this point. Uh, so, so don't read no, that in the wrong way. Isn't there a regulation to how far you can put a dock into a navigable there is. water? Yeah, there is. Okay, so then again, that's probably already regulated somewhere else rather than uh, us. Army Corps. Yep. Yeah. All right. So the approach from this point, we've discussed, we've given our opinions, suggestions. Um, are we going to then, you know, are you going to then put this all together and bring it, bring it back to us to, to review or? It, it seems, I think based on your, on your discussion, you're interested in proceeding with this and, and at least reviewing it as a possible land development code amendment. And so we'll bring it forward then in that context and uh, take your, your discussion that you've, that you've had. Thank you for the comments and thank the public also for their comments. And, and we'll come back, we'll see you in August. And so we'll uh, we'll discuss that then and uh, and see where it takes us. But thank you. Okay. So now we're going to go to um, number five A. Uh, the subject to proposed land development code amendment uh, to planning and development 
board membership requirements. Mr. Mingle. You know, I wanted to put this in because uh, we've, we've had some discussions about this uh, in, you know, over the, well, in the past, and, and so that uh, we've, 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 um, I, this is a, a, situ, a, a segment of the of the code that I, I love and hate. I know the intent was was good, and and I, I had a hand in this. I won't say that I was totally absolved of it, uh, but certainly there was there was maybe uh, some misguided intent here with with what the result was. So what what we did, and, and others will remember this more vividly because they were on the boards when the boards were effectively disbanded by creating a planning and development board, a planning board by a different name. We changed the composition of the board. First objective, I'm seeing some some anyway. I, this is I, how how am I going to dance out of this one, right, Mr. Boyd? So the so the idea there was was uh, we wanted to have always had this feel of of professions that would be represented on the planning board, and so you had uh, people who had professional backgrounds in business and industry. And planning was mentioned. Hopefully not so many planners. Planners don't make good members for planning and development boards. Just my opinion. I'm sorry, Mr. Good. The, um, I agree with you. Okay, good. No so the, the, uh, <laughs> but but the, the, the key is to have some profession relationship and so that you don't have maybe all planners or all real estate people on your board or all attorneys because you don't have diversity of ideas. So, so first spot, and we had that in the old version of the planning board, and then we took that and kind of changed that a little bit because the other perception was, right or wrong, that we had stacked the board with nothing but Palm Coast representation, or that, or that you at least had a more heavily slanted representation there. Arguably, I could make a case for that because the bulk of your, of your population in the county was and is from Palm Coast, so I could say there's some rationale for that. The the theory, though, at at the time when we we came up with this language, is we we want to restrict that. We want to make it where we have unincorporated people making unincorporated planning decisions, and so we're we're going to take that subset. We we want to you know maybe we're going to even just just prohibit. Uh, you know the 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 city residents from applying at all, and that was one of the amendments that did happen, um, and and that I necessarily don't agree with. You know you had that that idea of an elector uh, from the county, which I think is is valid. We had talked before. Could it even be just a landowner? You know if you own property here, but you happen to live across the line in Volusia or St. Johns County, you know you have potentially as much of a vested right as as anyone else in what happens in the county, and so. You know, why should we drill down that deep? But we, we did say that, and and I, I think that's still valid for us to stick with that because our other board makeup, for other boards, we, we require similar requirements. Uh, we require similar qualifications uh, for the, the elector within the county. Uh, this has a, a residency component that's uh, immediately there also. It says you must be homesteaded, homesteaded within unincorporated Flagler County. Then we took that one step further, and I am getting this a little bit out of order because then we went and we had this geographic area representation. We wanted with the seven members to be able to hey, to say, you know, here they are from this makeup. So not only professions that are that are divided up, but from these geographic areas, and and then at in in the schedule of how we did this, we did the geographic, and then we went in with the. Uh, the, the homestead requirement uh, from from the unincorporated area. So that's how we, we went through this whole iterations of this. Uh, the section that's been difficult for us and the reason why I'm bringing this forward now is this idea that you have east of the intercoastal waterway one representative, west of US 1 and south of State Road 100 one representative, west of US 1 and north of State Road 100, between US 1 and the intercoastal waterway north of State Road 100. Very okay. That's that's okay. That's that's a uh, it's a very defined area. US one and I ninety five south of one hundred, I ninety five and the intercoastal waterway south of uh, State Road one hundred, and one at large member. And then if we wanted to, the board could uh, come up and it and and designate additional at large members. It was hard to to meet those those qualifications. Uh, you can imagine west of US one and north of State Road one hundred, a difficult area for us. 
Uh, you, you probably have a handful of, of families that are there. Uh, you do have a couple of geographic areas that we have, Espanola, okay, really just one uh, that's there that we can choose from uh, as, as far as a, a potential source for applic applicants. Uh, difficult for us when we have a vacancy, difficult for us when we have to get quorum for our next meeting and we have those vacancies that are here. Uh, difficult from a staff standpoint, and I think this is really my, my biggest uh, point of agreement whenever we've had these discussions about this section and how problematic the language is, when we have a vacancy for a specific geographic area, your membership, your tag, your position on the board is not an at-large member. You are the representative west of US-1 and south of State Road 100. When your seat comes up, when you're, you've vacated, you've decided you've had enough, you don't want to be reappointed, or whatever reason you, you decide to leave the board, we will list that vacancy as seeking a candidate west of US-1 and south of State Road 100. And so if I'm out there and I'm interested in serving my community and I see that and I'm going to immediately say, I don't meet those qualifications, I'm not even going to apply. I've, I've been quick to defend this language by saying, by the way, the board can and regularly does waive these requirements. It is possible for the board to do so uh, we did add that language in here. It, it happens uh, maybe with too much frequency uh, that would tell you then that maybe there's this, this portion of the code is, is, is broken in some way if it happens too often. Uh, and, and again, knowing that there's certain areas of the county that are just going to be hard for us to get candidates because there's just not many people there. I, I think it's a good pure intent to have the representation scattered like this or to be distributed in this way. Uh, but I, I think that um, for it to be in a limiting factor as it has been, uh, I think is difficult for me to, to be able to explain away. And, and I certainly see that aspect. I think that argument's very, uh, very real to me when somebody sees it and they say, well, I don't, I don't meet the qualifications. I'm not even going to apply. And they, they want, may want to come forward and, and, and do so, but then on the face of it, you know, they're, they're not meeting that geographic area uh, qualification, and so they, they, uh, they, they don't then apply for, for that seat. I've included the, the, I think I included the full text of this section for you uh, to look at so that if, if you wanted to look more broadly at the makeup, uh, you could certainly do so. And, and wanting to hear your comments on this, I think the problem has been this geographic area representation that we've, we've discussed before, uh, but certainly any other recommendations that you have um, as far as a, a, uh, an amendment to this section in, in whole, uh, section 2.02.02 .02 that I, I have pulled up here, I, I'd certainly be uh, willing to come back with something on that and bring that back for your consideration also in, at the August meeting. With that, I'll close, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mingle. Mr. Langello. Okay, so to add some more history to our conversation, we, um, and not everyone on this board, but some of us already heard this and already made a recommendation to make some changes and to send it up, and that was over two years ago, to make some changes to this. So I don't, and the discussion again is fine, Adam, but just to, in all clarity, we already did make that motion, we went through a whole thing, put it on the agenda, made a whole motion to make changes. Um, so that's what I was actually hoping tonight that we would see um, the actual, some of the, the suggested language. So barring that, I guess we're just taking sort of a mini step back. Um, and then we have new people on the board, so you'll have new comments. Um, so, uh, actually two of the, of the people who were on it before were actually uh, because of that geographical makeup, because they lived within a city, would no longer, and the old board would no longer been allowed to sit on a board. Um, I, I was one of the drivers of this, so, you know, I'll, I'll take my uh, credit and fall where it'd be. I was on a previous, the previous county's planning board, and we had no regulation to their residency at all. And we, as you said, we had mostly people who were from living in Palm Coast. Now, there's anything wrong with living in Palm Coast, but we were kept hearing issues out on the west side of the county that the people in Palm Coast may not have any real sensitivity to because they're used to a Palm Coast zoning, which is very regulated, and you keep, keep your lawn this way, and everything, you know, you're all close proximity to each other, so we're gonna regulate how you think and what you do on your property. I don't mean how you think, but basically what your poem looks like and everything. We're gonna have 
tighter regulations because of the proximity of the lot together and because of the mentality of, of urban type living versus a very rural living, which is much more, you know, laissez faire. Do what you do what you want on your property. Now we have to respect all people's property rights. So we we in my opinion, we sort of had people who weren't sensitive to the fact that you can't over-regulate people on the west side because that isn't that isn't what most of the people who bought the property wanted. They didn't want the county to come out and tell them how high they have to have their lawn cut and and you know what is going to happen here and what's going to happen there. But we do have zoning and you have to have some of that. So there is a, a balancing act. And so I was making the push back then that we make some sort of um, requirement that some of the members be members from unincorporated county, especially from the west side. And that's as far as I had asked it to be. Not that this necessarily was my doing, but that board was then summarily dismissed and a new board came in with these much more, it went, you know, pendulum swung all the way. And I don't think it's on all or nothing. I think there was some good things in here, but as we talked about two years ago, we should probably fix this by making it not so restrictive. You know, let's find that middle ground that probably might work. And my recommendation, and I think the way we, the way I remember we left it, is we weren't going to, we were going to try to eliminate these different districts, which are very similar to a voting district, because it doesn't really make any sense. We're not representing any particular district. We're all um, looking at every item together. We're not voted on by anybody. Um, we're appointed by the county commission as a whole, not from a particular district. So the, all of the district things I thought could be eliminated, and either we make it that the board have of the seven, maybe three or four members that have to be from unincorporated areas. And again, that could be waived if you can't find them. And I would tell you the same thing, the way you were saying how the, the board can make recommendations and the board can change, you know, some stuff. You can do it the other way too. You could come back and say, no, I'm not gonna allow these candidates because I wanna have more people from the West Side. You can, if you, you can do that as well. Um, it doesn't have to be where we regulate it so much and they have to ask for permission. You can do it the other way and, and make, make the board make it tighter as well. You can, it can go both ways. So I think if you land it in the middle, where you were doing just a certain amount of members. I didn't agree with the homestead um, um, provision. I don't think, you know, again, I don't see how a homestead is gonna require, is gonna make you any more vested or not vested as a landowner. Um, and as I said, there are definitely, there, there, there are planning boards within this county. One of them I served on, which was in Benel. It does, you don't have to live in the city. Um, I'm a major landowner in Benel and I, um, well, I shouldn't say major. Not even, I'm a I'm a major taxpayer in Benel, um, and I and I was um, probably the top taxpayer in Benel, and I was on their planning board, and rightly so, um, because I'm paying a lot of these taxes, and their their rules are affecting me. I would argue the same thing. I don't know if we necessarily need as tight of regulations. I think if you want to hold it to landowners, whatever. But but the but the permanent resident in Flagler County, I could even go with that, but whether or not it has to be a homestead person, verified by the, I just think that was going down rabbit holes that didn't really pertain to being a good member on a board. Um, and again, the board, the commission can decide not to accept, you know, seven members who all live in Michigan. That's their option. They don't, they can, op, they, can they don't have to accept, it. it's their option who they pick. So, I, you know, the fact that, that it that you don't have it in there doesn't mean that okay well that means we're going to have you know seven members from you know wherever it doesn't mean that at all it, it but it does open up the gene pool um, I could see sitting here tonight we have a good board so so to some degree this is not a total disaster <laughs> okay but um, I would still think that that loosening it up could help um, open this up to more people. And some of us who were getting older in life could step down and new people come in. So I, that was my two cents. I think we should just dumb it down a bit and make it more open and, and not so um, restrictive, which is what this was. Mr. Boyd. Yes, sir. <clears throat> some years ago, I was on the, I was on the planning board, long range planning board for the county. And they did away with that planning board and came up with another essentially a planning board, but they call it some a different name. 
There were 13 members on that board. I was one of them. Now this was the long range planning board for Flagler County. Out of the 13 members, I was the only person on that board that was from unincorporated Flagler County. And I thought that was, anyway, they had a consultant, the county had a consultant there to talk to us and he asked each one of us where we were from and why we wanted to serve on the board. And everybody made their comments, and when it got around to me, I, I said, because I live in unincorporated Flagler County, and I'm, I'm the only one on the board that does. And the other board members, who were all from Palm Coast and Flagler Beach, were kind of shocked at that, and they wanted to know why that was the case. Why, you know. <clears throat> and then, at, at some point, not too long after that, they had a consultant come in, and we went to a room right upstairs up here, and they set up a bunch of various tables, and they had all of the west side of the county, west of US-1, they had aerial photographs of it. And everyone in the room was given little, little uh, emblems, little, little things like you see in a Monopoly game, hotels, houses, apartment complexes, little plastic toys that look like those, those things service stations, and they divided us up into groups of three or four, and we all stood around the table, and they wanted us to plan out for the west side of Flagler County what should be built in various places on the west side of Flagler County. So they all stood around and uh, at the inter different various intersections and other places and placed these little emblems out there, you know, None of those people had, they didn't even know where these intersections were. They'd never been out there. And they were placed in little hotels and little apartment buildings. They, and I asked the consultant, and I, just, I thought it was nonsense. I just asked the consultant, I said, what are, you, what are you trying to do here? And he says, well, we want these people to plan out where all the development's gonna go on the west side of Flagler County. And I said, do you realize none of these people, if you ask them to drive to that intersection, they couldn't get there, they've never been there. Why, why would these people be planning out? <clears throat> My point is, and I know this might not be a, a, popular, <laughs> a popular idea, but, um, and I may disagree with Mr. Langello here, but I'm not sure I understand why people in Palm Coast or Flagler Beach or Bunnell would be sitting on the Flagler County Planning and Development Board or the, Pla or the Flagler County Long Range Planning Board. Palm Coast wouldn't ask us on the west side of the county to sit on one of their boards, and, and, and I think rightly so. So, and, and I do agree with Mr. Langello that this, the, the way we got this, well, you have this divided up here, somebody north of US-1, somebody south of US-1, seems like would complicate matters a whole lot. Um, but anyway, that's my two cent, that's my one cent. <laughs> Mike, if I could tell you, I, I agree with you. Um, actually, I saw that same exercise because they gave it to our planning board too, but not in the same way. But we, if we, the way this is written, this is written where you are the one member in effect who represents the West Side. If you step down when that, when that time comes, then there is, then that one seat is open. And if it's not filled by that, somebody else, then not. They'll, they'll allow them to fill something else and they'll, that'll be filled by someone else from some other area. Then another seat comes up, but okay, now that's flag the beach area. They're not gonna look for a west side person there. That's why I think if you make it, and, I, and if we have it all just unincorporated county, which if we had enough people who were running up to these boards to, to sign up and you know, we, we could, could understand what's going on and, and deal with this type of stuff, then I would agree with you 100%, but we don't have the, 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 the gene pool yet, and I think that's why I was saying the, the happy medium is say three or four of the seven be unincorporated people. I mean, what's wrong with three of those people being from the west side of the county? Because right now you can have at most one and, and very likely none the way this is. And if we say it's all unincorporated county, then what, who do we have sitting on the board when we can't find those people? That's that, so it's sort of, that was my quandary is that it's, it's, you can't get all or one of either way. You have to sort of find that medium ground that 
that would work? Well, I can tell you this. I know a number of people from the west side of the county who, who have sat on these boards and would, and would like to sit on these boards today, but they feel like, they feel like kind of like I feel, that they would be the only voice from unincorporated Flagler County sitting on a Flagler County board and they don't, they don't feel like it makes a whole lot of sense. They don't feel like they're, they would, it would be spending their time wisely to do that, that they're, you know, that they're outnumbered and, you know, things like that. I, 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 I can imagine there might be some instances where you would have a problem getting enough people, but I don't think that would be a, a major, I, I think if it was advertised well and people spoke it up that you would have enough people so what if Coming of the forward. seven people, you say at least five of them were unincorporated people, leaving two, two seat, at large, two at large seats, again, trying to, to fill those spaces right. that we're going to have an issue with? And, and on to that, drop the homestead to just property owner. Right. I think dropping the homestead is going to open up a lot of doors. Um, and I agree with Mr. Langello. Whether you're a homestead or you're a property owner, you still you have vested interest in that area, so it shouldn't matter if it's your homestead or not. Well, you could be a homestead and not homestead and still live in a property. Absolutely. And so that that homestead exemption thing is is a right. tax qualification, sure. and not anything else. It's kind of a weird thing to throw I mean, for, in there. For one, for sure, I think the homestead should be should be taken out, um, and I, I I like the idea of maybe you know and concentrating it more you know the five um not not unincorporated Flagler county and then the two two at large would would make sense or or four three at large i don't know i'm not sure where we're going with that is that um you got to be a landowner and a, and a registered voter but not necessarily homestead your property. I mean, what what is the criteria that we that we use so that we have people that are vested in the community serving on the board? I think Mr. Boyd makes a good point too, and that is Flagler County has unique niches. I live in a district that happens to be between the Intercoastal Waterway and I-95, way down on the south end of the county, within a half a mile of Volusia County. So when the Meadows came up a few meetings ago, I was intimately familiar with that issue because I live there. I work and have worked for decades up in the hammock. And I also have a real close connection with all the things that are going on in the hammock. I don't have any um, intimate understanding of the west side like, like Mike does. I don't have any intimate understanding of, of the hammock area in the residential part like Mike does. Um, and so I think there's value in these designated zones or districts because it brings a unique perspective to the board. Do we make it five districts and two at large? I, I don't know, maybe that works. I don't have a magic, magic uh, answer here. But I think that some form of having district boundaries for at least a majority of this board makes sense because Flagler County has unique little niches. I mean, the southeast corner of Flagler is different from the northeast corner, is different from the areas surrounding Palm Coast uh, up toward Princess Place, is different from the west side uh, of farming districts. So I think we got to do that, and I also think we need to. I mean, I think we need to keep a component of that, and I also think we need to make sure that people are invested in the county. I, I don't think that people who simply live and work here, even if they're registered voters, if they haven't bought and paid taxes and have an interest long-term investment in the community, I'm not sure I want them making decisions about what the long-term future of my land use looks like. Um, and so I think it's got to be more than just live and vote in, in, in Flagler County. I think you've got to be an owner. Whether you're homesteaded or not, I, don't, I agree. I don't think that makes any difference. Absolutely, an owner. I agree with you there. Yeah, I don't know where the voting comes in either. 
I mean, I think you can. I don't think the voting makes No, no, but I'm just saying it's in there, but I don't know where that necessarily, again, plays. I'm, I'm what they call a super voter, so I vote in every election, you know. But not everybody votes in every election. But does that make their opinion and their viewpoint um, when it comes to planning any more or less valid? So I would. I don't know if you if you're not invested in the democratic process, then how how well versed are you in civics? You might be one on one that very you need well, I, in order to make good decisions on the board. You know, I know some people, and I'm not going to mention names, but they are um, they just don't vote at all. They're they're disgusted with the whole voting system, but they're very involved in the community. Um, some people are philanthropic, some people are business people, and whatever they you would assume these people vote, but they don't. Um, and now we're making, I mean, and I'm not going to, again, that's one person in particular went out and registered to vote so he can run for an office. I mean, it's just a, it doesn't really mean anything as far as that. It, 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 so someone will have to go and just register to vote just so they can be on this board, but they may never vote. It doesn't mean that they will or won't, you know, participate in the democratic process, and nor does that necessarily have any validity whether or not they could be a good person to, to look at planning issues. Um, unfortunately, we don't actually do a lot of the long-term planning here. We're, we we should, all. we should, but we really don't get to do that. Um, that's sort of, um, I don't know who's doing that anymore anyway, but. We are planning, we are planning, and we are in the planning and development yes. business for unincorporated flag County. I, I agree, Mike. Mr. 100%. Langello, uh, the requirement that you be an elector is common to all of our advisory boards as far as I'm aware. And what it does is it means you're 18, you're a United States citizen, you are a permanent resident, uh, not necessarily homestead, but your residence is here. Uh, like you said, that's a very tricky analysis. And that your civil rights have not been taken away. But doesn't, uh, okay, so the civil rights one I can, see where maybe where you're going that I think there's other ways to do it, to regulate that but in the application and there's an application to be on the board that the that the five commissioners get to review that application so if the guy is his address is in Kuwait and um, and a whole bunch of other things that were you just mentioned that that were perhaps you're trying to regulate they would see it in the application anyway so I don't know if it if it if that in itself is the way you would determine whether or not somebody is a resident or their age would could easily, are you over 18, yes or no, or whatever? I mean, it, it, I could be over the 18, legal resident, all that kind of stuff, and not be a voter. So you didn't necessarily, you know, a limit what you're looking for. You just got a voter. And just because the other boards did it doesn't necessarily mean it's correct. That's all I'm saying. I, I, I'm a voter, so I'm not, I don't, and this is nothing with me, you know, I'm just looking at it objectively. Having a question for Adam, I guess, if we move move it to two at-large members, they can be from anywhere, right? Uh, so, you know, you could have two at-large members from Western County. I mean, it doesn't matter. You know, it gives, would that give you enough flex, would that give enough flexibility when we're advertising to, you know, get a, a pool of people because then it's not as restricted with two of them? It, 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 it would help. I don't. I don't want to negate that. And you know, and and just what Mr. Boyd had said. You know, it's um, you know, look at, looking at. Um, well, you actually you actually said there are others that are interested in, in serving. They're just they're, they're thinking their their voice won't be heard anyway. Uh, but the west of US one, it's just it's just hard. You know, I think uh, overall, uh, you know, and I think if if I had had uh, up to me, I'd I probably just have the one district, then west of US one, and then add the two at at large would be a quick solution. And then I think the in the ad itself, when we had a vacancy that happened in a geographic area, I would make sure that uh, somehow there's some verbiage that says you know if, if a candidate doesn't meet the geographic area qualification, it could be waived by the board. Something to you know. My my worry with all of this is that as you get further down than the qualifiers, you, somebody is self-regulating the, their application. That they're coming back and they're saying, well, you know, what, why am I even going to do that? And, and they're interested in serving, but they don't meet that requirement. Whatever those qualifications are, I think the elector is is part of that. I think you know, borrow what off of what. Mr. Moylan said is that you know, that's a, it's a very easy way to delineate 
you know, we're certain things that you that you would have as as far as all that goes into an elector, um, and and so the, you know that's a that's an easy qualifier. And again, it's cross board for all of our our boards that we have that. I I, I don't really want to see us doing anything different there, but realizing that we can we can do that if we want to. The overall objective of me asking about this is to create a bigger pool of applicants. And so that we don't have the, the difficulty that we had had in the past. Thankfully, right now we don't have that issue, but we have a, a, a vacancy of more than one board member for a, a number of months while we're waiting to try to fill that that position, and that that creates a, a difficulty for us in meeting quorum. Now, you know, another thing, you're how these these particular districts. Again, I'm going to just go back this for a second. The west side of the county is probably the largest volume of land right. that this planning board would see. And uh, no disrespect to Mr. Connor, but his area may be the smallest area of, of land in these different zones of unincorporated land. So you're, again, by limiting it to the way this is done, you have one member who may be from an area that's, you know, three quarters of the county or larger, and then other areas that we're seeing. So again, that's why, to me, I think dumbing it down a bit, letting, letting those people show up that be there and let the let the commission be more of the decider of it as time goes on than this very cold hard thing that I think it's going to be difficult you know you know we you you said it right too because we've had areas we've had two vacancies for a long time on this board we've had it and um, and we commonly have been sitting people who don't sit in those districts just to fit somebody in so that's why I thought when we talked about it last time we were going to try to um, when we all weren't in agreement, you know, Mike definitely wanted 100% of the board unincorporated. And I understand that. I just don't think we have enough. And that was Mike. If we did, I'd be with you, but I don't think we do. But Are you more clear now or more, less clear? Well, and I, I was going to mention just, just for giggles, uh, and I think we'd even talked about this one, and I hate to even say it, but between US-1 and the Intercoastal Waterway north of State Road 100, when we get down, when you think about it with the qualifier of the unincorporated area, your Palm Coast Plantation and or Princess Place. And so I, I, think, that's, I think that's really it. I, I'm, I'm wanting to see if somebody can tell me where I'm, I'm wrong there, but I think that's, if I'm unincorporated by my qualifier, between US-1 and the Intercoastal, north of State Road 100, um, I, I'm, I'm pretty limited there, mm -hmm. you know, if, I, if I'm saying that. And, uh, and there may be a few exceptions here and there, but that's, that's what I'm left with there. And so, um, you know, you, you have some, I, I was almost thinking when you, when you were talking that uh, in, in the discussion of maybe even making it into just quadrants that would be as easy as, uh, you know, start out thinking US-1, but US-1 kind of puts us way over there. So maybe I-95 and, and 100 being our, 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 our place where we have our, our quadrants. But then, uh, you know, and, and then I think geographically, I mean, those are, those are large land masses, but I have, I have unincorporated areas in, in kind of both of those. If I, if I take it all the way over to, you know, I, I think I'm probably still back. The smallest area of unincorporated would be that southeast quadrant when I get done doing that. Uh, but I, I, that, may, that may be an option for us. Uh, you know, again, keeping that, that ability for the board to waive those requirements. I, I, I think it's served us as well to be able to have the diverse board. My, my caution still is, is that I, I think people are looking at that and saying, well, I don't meet those qualifications. I'm not even going to apply. And, and then we've had a couple of times we've had some discussions with good applicants to come back and say, no, 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 please apply. And then, and then the board consider a, can consider a waiver of that. But that takes uh, you know, that, that involvement for us to have that discussion with those candidates. I like the idea of the board uh, being able to waive the requirement. You you might have someone that's lived in this county 30 years, and maybe they lived in one part of town and uh, for 20, and they moved to another for 10. They might have some good experience, and maybe they just don't fit this criteria, but you could waive it knowing knowing that they perhaps lived in, in a certain area for 20 years, or maybe own property in both. So, I like the quadrant idea. So, the, but with that, what I would what I would have is then three at large. Right. Um, I've heard you say two at large. 
maybe I'll, maybe I'll come back with something you know with the, the quadrant idea and then have three at large and well look at the geographical area though so maybe you need to weight it more right you can still maybe just two at large okay and then um, remove the homestead requirement I mean, that's what I think you I, I I mean I I fully think that should be removed how does everyone feel about that? I'm, 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 I like it. Mr. Langella likes it. Goodman likes it. Mr. Boyd is nodding his head. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thumbs well, up. Adam, if you're talking about two at large, and the rest of them are from unincorporated. I think we, we haven't talked about doing anything different on the, un, at least the, the intent would be they're unincorporated from those geographic areas, yes sir. And even the at large would, would still have the unincorporated qualifier. You still right. have that in, in play, you know, it, subject to waiver by the board. Well, they're all subject to waiver by the, sure. I mean, each of them individually are subject to waiver, yeah. Yes sir. Okay. Uh, the, the quadrant idea is good. I mean, is there, do we really even have to make it a quadrant, can we just look at a map and kind of outline certain, the, the areas that way? What, what is the difference between having it 5-2 or 4-3 or whatever you decide for drawn districts and at-large seats and see which says already should an area be deemed by the board uh, um, no. whenever there are competing applications no that's not what I was in where the, where the provision in there that already says the board can waive uh, at any point anyway if the county commission can already say we're going to waive the district requirement, and we're going to we're going to take an applicant at large, and by a simple majority vote of the county commission, they can place that individual on this board. What's the difference in that authority that's already in the code, and setting up at large districts? And I'm not saying I. I, I, I what he, one of the reasons why he gave was that just one that, of the reasons it, does, was that if was we the got the at large districts listed. At, then we encourage a larger pool of applicants because people aren't dissuaded from making the application. That would be Is that the only change? Well, that would. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. Um, I think you can also make an argument of, and and I, I don't think the board explicitly does it when they do the appointments. I think it, it, it it's in, it's implied that the you know the if I already have representation, somebody comes in, they're in the city limits. And and they may have made application. They're you know they're they're not meeting the qualification we have. We want to say unincorporated. We want to say homesteaded. Whatever the case may be, uh, you know the board's not saying. Oh, and by the way, as part of my uh, selecting of this of this candidate to be serving on the planning and development board, I am issuing a waiver for X. They're they're not they're not doing that. But I I think just intuitively you want to make those those situations where they're 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 few. So um, instead of every that, time, if if you're doing it every time, I think the the language is broken. Okay. And okay. So we eliminate the special exception or variance kind of concept and lock in the fact that at large is is going to be a component part of our structure, and by doing that, we get away from having to use some kind of special exception procedure for approval, and we also encourage a larger pool of applicants because people have a public published document now that says that there's two at-large seats on the, available on the board. Is that the logic? I, I, I think that'd be it. I'm, I'm not sure if that's necessarily gonna, gonna solve still what, what my feeling is and unless we, we just in what we hand out to, to folks in our application say guess what if if you don't meet these qualifications it can it can still be subject to waiver by the board because I, I still think there's some some self-selection that's happening there where somebody looks at it and says well I, I don't meet that why am I even going to apply because I'm, I'm not meeting the, the initial qualification I, I guess my my rhetorical point is you know what, what is the problem we're trying to fix 
we got a full board right now. We all seem to be functioning well. I know we went through a rough patch when I first got on. We were looking to play seats and we barely had a quorum at, at some meetings and no quorum at others. I remember that. But right now, as we sit, um, what's the problem that we're trying to fix? Well, I can answer that because it's not always that way. And I, again, I argue that just one member from the west side of the county still does not seem appropriate the way that we're doing this. They are the largest land mass in this county. And, um, and it's definitely a, diff a whole different mindset of zoning and the way it's set up right now, if in this particular case, it's Mr. Boyd. If Mr. Boyd was not to serve again in a couple months, we very well may not have anybody from the west side of the county for a long time to come on this board instead of having maybe two board members and, and encouraging them to, to stay on here. Because I was in this county, you were here for a long time too, but I was in this county when people on the west side of the county had a lot more say, and I know what you're talking about. They don't feel as if they have any more of a say, but they're getting, they're being regulated, and I think it needs to be looked at fairly. They, that area, just as the people in the hammock want their point of view heard, and they should be, the people on the west side should have their point of view heard and heard on, up here on this board. And, I, and that's where this whole thing started years ago. And, um, and I think that the, the solution that was made to fix that one issue was so detailed that it, it, it is, it's limiting the factor. And again, I, I, you know, the geographical districts got more land out there than anywhere else. And, and I think this is, that's, so the problem, if you look at, you know, you look at a totally functioning car, you say, well, what do we need to do any repair for? You know, what do we need service stations for? Because the car's running great. It's not always gonna run great. You know, so you don't plan for the best times, you plan for the worst time. And we know this has already happened, will happen again. Well, I get that, but let's say we've got a 5-2 split. And the guy that walks is one of the ones that in designated area, and the two at-large positions are full. We're, we're still facing the same problem, aren't yeah, we? I, I, I'm, I'm not seeing the, the, the solution the way you are. I keep saying that I think this should be more dumbed down and, and you know, I would agree. I agree with Mike. If we can get seven members to be all on, on, on and, and that's the way you still have it, fine. But I don't know if you're going to get all those members unincorporated. But in the meantime, I, I don't know if we should strictly regulate that this guy is from this area and this guy is from that area because it sets you up for not having people in those areas because of the way it's so regulated. And it and it, the commission's ability to look at applications and to and to weed them in and out, but we shouldn't be, we're weeding them out before they ever got the application, this process. It, let, let the, you know, get a bigger pool of people for them to look at, and we would have the opportunity to have this thing seated in the future by well-deserving people who can do the right job versus just somebody because of their zip code address or whatever. It just, it, to me, it wasn't necessarily the only way to do it. Mm -hmm. I have a question. What is the population density or population number on the west side versus the east side? Um, I, I, that's a good question, Mike. I don't know if the population is the, necessarily the issue, though, because we don't we don't regulate population. No, no, regulate I'm not saying land. regulating. I'm saying, <clears throat> for example, let's say you have five thousand people that live out on the west side, and then you have a hundred thousand that live on the east side. You know, so you're talking about underrepresentation, <clears throat> but maybe it really isn't because if you go by population. Yeah, but I don't, again. And, you know, just because there's land mass and it only might be owned by, you know, maybe the majority of that land mass is only owned by a dozen families. So you're going by land mass and it doesn't make as much well, sense to me I'm as, but I understand what you're trying to do. But at the same token, you have to look at what is the population in the different geographical areas. So if you have, like I said before, if you, let's say you have 10,000 out there and you have 100,000 100, in this area, so then the makeup would be maybe one person from out there, not two like you're suggesting. Well, what, what I'm not advocating for a certain number of people from the west side of the county. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to trying to see if we can get a certain number of people from unincorporated Flagler County. 
So if, if you're using your scenario, you can compare how many people are on the west side of the county to how many people are on the east side of the county in unincorporated Flagler County. Unincorporated, I got you. See what I mean? I, so I'm not advocating for everybody to be, right. everybody on the board to be from the west side of the no, county. No, no, I understand. I'm not, I'm no, not I saying understand. that. But we'd never get that anyway. We'd never but, get that anyway. But you know, they, if by eliminating the homestead element to it. Yeah, I think that helps. I think yeah, that helps huge. this whole situation again. It, it allows people who are more, who are vested and have interest and knowledge to do something versus just where you lay your head down on your pillow at night yeah. and decide to get that particular tax advantage. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mangle. So uh, listen to everything, uh, and the weird thing then uh, realizes if, if we're not taking, if we're taking away the homestead, then we, then we and in, in I'm thinking, we lose the geographic qualifier anyway. Because uh, then I'm, I mean, heck, I'm, I'm a P.O. box in Bunnell. I mean, you know, are you going to argue with me about it? You know, I, I'm, that's where I get my mail. That's where I'm a, an elector. I, I, when I, I guess I, I didn't answer that right because your election is tied to a residence. So when you're when you you do have a residency that's established, it could be a rental. You know, it may not doesn't necessarily be homestead. So maybe that's it. We base. Well, your I, I think we should still keep a five the county residency to it now. To I don't. I don't think we need to to go that far out of the county to to get. Yeah. The, so I think keeping that element. So that is one of the element that to be a five the county resident. Just just trying to find the way to tie it back into the geography, so that you know the elector then we we'd use the address for the for the voter tie that in. What I was thinking as y'all were discussing it, so what if we did two from west of US 1? It's always been the weird thing for me, north of 100. Makes no sense. So two from west of US 1, and then two, wait, one from uh, east of US 1, north of 100, one from uh, east of US 1, south of 100, and then three at large. And then, and then water down the language where instead of it follows very much like we do for the professions, you know, wherever possible, you know, or, or whenever. Well, I, I'm also if, hearing what. But I if think, you're talking about, again, Mike, Mike brought about population and I'm talking about geographical area, both of them would maybe look at two people north of 100 east of US 1 okay. versus the south because there is a, you know, that's still, there's, there's only a limited amount on the south side oh, still. That's fine. And, you know, and I, I think just uh, another caution I had was from one of your comments, and I think we may have had one of our hearings where somebody had done that, where they had called out one of our board members and said, you represent my district. And it's kind of like, no, I, I, I'm recalling that. And so I think that's, that's another good point that's being made is that, you know, while these geographic things We were come threatened in, by one of those people not to be voted back into our position, too. Uh, yes, yeah. good point. <laughs> So I, I, I think if we could, if we could, maybe the homework would be to make this wherever possible type language that, that softens the geographic requirements, takes preferred, away the homestead, preferred or desirable, or whatever. And, and if you like that idea, I'm I'm in I'm in step with that. If it's two on uh, west of US one, uh, two from that area uh, east of US one, north of one hundred, one from that area uh, east of US one, south of one hundred, two at large, I'm in good shape. And remove the homestead. Remove the homestead. All right. I'm good with that. I'm good with that. Onward and upward. Whew. Number 5B. I'd like to make a motion. I'd like to make a motion at this point to um, postpone this discussion to another date. I'm pretty well burnt out at this point, and I can't think straight anymore. I don't know how the other board members feel about it. Well, I, Mike, I agree with you. I haven't had a chance to really go through this I don't know if we need to open it up for any type of for your for any kind of presentation you might want to make on it but I I agree that I'm not only tired but I did not get a chance to, I mean this is pretty involved I, I, and I don't want to borrow and, and Mr. Clark's been patient here I, I do if we could at least let him I, I think you you probably have um Maybe you haven't seen that, but I think his expectation was he was just as well surprised that this was going to be on the agenda. He had sent me this in, was it June? I think it was around, right around June. And so, and so I was like, as long as we're talking about it, let's talk about it. I, I don't want to deprive him of a chance if he wants to right. you know, say a few things just yeah. as, as guiding principles, if mm -hmm. nothing else. And so that you can, you can take what, what he's telling you about the objective, if, if you don't mind at least giving him that opportunity. And then, and then take the time to read it over, and if we could talk mm -hmm. about it then in August, I, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. I, I, 
I agree. I, I, I'm fine with that. I mean, time limit wise, have him come up for ten minutes if he needs it, and and then we we adjourn from there. Good with that, guys. He said two minutes. Two? I, let's hold him to the two minutes. He said two there minutes. There you go. That two minutes is fine. We'll, hey, we'll, we'll, give you th we'll give you three minutes. I was going to. I was. I was giving. I was giving you ten. Yes. I mean, uh, My name is Dennis Clark. Uh, I'm the uh, chair of the Scenic Gay One A Pride Committee. Um, I think it did surprise me a little, as Adam said, because uh, I thought we'd be discussing this with whoever's updating the land development code, and we expected these changes to go in the rewrite of the land development code, not as a separate. Um, amendment to the, to the uh, code. So, um, but I think it's good to have a little bit of historical perspective. The, um, the scenic corridor overlay, it's been with us for 20 years now. It started in, in 2001 and then was updated in 2004. It has served us well. Our Florida Scenic Highway became a national scenic byway and now an all-American road. It's a tourist attraction in itself and a beautiful, peaceful, unique oasis in Florida. However, we have noticed that the Land Development Code has its shortcomings. Every restaurant in the hammock has a parking problem, the worst one being the Shape of Water, which hasn't even opened yet. Bronx Pizza was approved by TRC without an A1A Pride site review of parking architecture or signage. And <clears throat> with the imminent prospect of wastewater service along A1A, we need to consider the potential for smaller commercial entities popping up along the scenic corridor. There are other considerations too, including how PUDs can increase density and clear cut trees and how redevelopment can take 40% of the index tree caliper even after it was previously developed. Um, there, there are probably, I don't know, there, there are many other instances and if you look at the detail you'll see where we tried to uh, correct some of those issues that came up in the past. So hopefully you, could, you have time to do that and you could give your input to Adam. I'm not sure that we have to vote on anything because uh, this, I'm hoping to get most of these into the land development code rewrite. That's, that's our objective. And hopefully that's within the next 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah, we, we don't have a consultant anymore, and so that uh, our, our contract expired there, and so that what, what my objective uh, was, I'll say was, was to get through impact fees, uh, comprehensive plan, and then land development code in that, in that order. And so we're taking these a bit out of cycle. I, I don't want to. I don't want to deprive anybody of a, of the ability to look for land development code amendments. You know, I think this is something we've talked about, Mr. Clark. Uh, uh, some questions have come up. How how come now? I I think there's there's some things that we realize uh, collectively uh, could use some refinement. Uh, I like what you said, Mr. Connor, and I wanted to make sure I had my chance to say this out loud. And, and we think of some of the commercial development we've had. The RC has been a little difficult for us. And, and again, recognizing limitations, we have parking, uncompanied land use buffers, uh, stormwater attenuation that you have to the extent you have that. And, and then certainly the, the utility availability, the, the need to have a portion of your site dedicated to, to septic tank and drain field. What that's resulted in, and you, you have then again, I guess the qualifier that I need to add in, in an RC zoning situation, 10,000 square foot minimum for special exception, that ends up being in practice, you need a, a minimum four of those 50 by 100 lots to make anything work. You're right at that half acre threshold. You know, it's one of those hindsight things that we looked at and we, you know, we were very quick to brush through it and say, of course you can have your commercial piece there. You're over 10,000 square feet. You're good to go. Come in, get your special exception. Everything's great. In practice, you've got to have those four together. Even removing the residential component that we were requiring for a number of years from that math to make it work with all of your site planning considerations, to, to have all that coming into play, you've got to have those four lots together. And, and, and maybe, maybe four is too many. I don't know, maybe four is not enough, uh, but that puts you right at that 20,000 square foot threshold uh, with, with that math, if I'm thinking correctly. And so just a, a consideration that's out there. I, I'm calling that out because your, your comment on your own experience you know, made me think of that and, and that that's been, been difficult for us. And, and certainly, you know, I, I'm, I'm liking the work that uh, Treasure Coast RPC had done that we've, we've relied on somewhat. 
whether or not it's a guiding document, whether or not it is, it is not. Uh, Mr. Clark and I have talked about that a couple of times and how, you know, the, the objective there would be to create some of these commercial nodes so that we're not having effectively what could be allowed on the map spatially right now where every one of those RC zoning parcels, provided they meet the 10,000 square foot, provided they go through the special exception process, could come in as a commercial type operation. And so is that really what you want to have, is that those driveways space then effectively one every 100 feet along A1A, you know, for that, the, those, that variety of boutique retail or whatever those uses may be. Uh, so a consideration for you. I, I don't know if I exactly agree on the restaurant aspects. I know we've got those problems that are just being mentioned, and, and uh, those ones that you called out are, are definitely some of those that I, I think fall into that category. And, and so um, I'm not necessarily agreeing on all points, but I think that we need to look at this, and, and I'm prepared to do it uh, here over the, if, if not completely in August, uh, uh, over the next few months uh, in advance of any broader effort to update the Land Development Code, I think it's, it's appropriate to do so. Are there any, were there any questions that you had for me? I'll make one comment, though. I didn't read the whole thing. I did see one thing I mentioned earlier I did like, which is to incorporate more pervious or non-hard non surface parking in our, in our code in general. So that too, yeah. I mean, not necessarily just in the overlay district. Yeah. It just... That would make a big difference. Yeah. And then up. It makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, and, and keep it natural. And I, I like the idea of the wayfinding. I like the idea of the of the of the effectively the theming through the architectural standards. Uh, so I, I'm I'm not adverse to those, and, and I think that you know that that uh, that component we need to we need to talk some more about uh, with that. But uh, you know, certainly I think there's some some things for us to chew on there. And if you can uh, review it, if you've got questions, feel free to reach out to Mr. Clark directly. I, you know you don't have to make me the conduit, uh, but if you feel more comfortable doing that, since you you may be taking an action on. This, this, do that. I'll be I'll be happy to to do that, and then copy all of the board members. Uh, that may likely be the better path to heads because if, if you're having the question, somebody else likely is as well. And so if you can keep it in that context, but I, I don't want to restrict anyone from from conversing. Just just know I'd like to be at some point in in their part of that record so we can create that public record and 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 uh, hopefully address those those questions collectively. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm assuming that we're not, we're, that was pretty much, we're not going to necessarily take this up in the next meeting. It would be brought up when we're going to do um, land development issues. When it comes to us, we can then be hearing this again. Because uh, we don't we don't have, unless you wanted to put this on the agenda of the next time, are you, I mean, is that what we're doing or what? I, I, I wanted to because I, I, I think that just what. I know. I mean, I mean, I think it would be appropriate to, to as this develops, to bring it back. I think that would be, make sense. I don't know if you, if you like, if you're pushing it forward for a change that you're not even doing yet. Um, I mean, the, the input and whatever may be more valuable to take it as it comes than to push it to the next meeting. I, I've, I, and maybe I'm misspeaking, but the, to me, the imperative is here that if the, if the utility extensions are happening. You know, there there is a sense of, of some urgency that will happen that will come along with the sewer extension. So, are you making the rewrite to the LDC? Then is that what you're saying? Well, as I mentioned to you, the first little bit is that let me get through with the impact fees if we can make that happen, and then we do have an obligation to get through the comprehensive plan. I don't think we're talking about years any longer. Right. Uh, of course, I say that with the land development code, so, code that now is into its ninth year of update. So, um, you know, again, what I have done on a previous board, not on the county board, but they one by one th went through sections and able to give at a meeting a time to each section to hear it versus throwing in, in effect, we had three different elements tonight, plus we continued the first one, but we still had public comment and went through that. It would make sense not to throw it all in, in one big meeting to kind of spread it out. So as you develop those things to bring it back, then trying to come at the next meeting and that's what I'm saying, pushing it forward when you don't have a timeline to pass it right now makes less sense than let it develop and do a fair job on your side, let them do their side, and we can look at it as well. That's all I was saying. I don't know why you'd want to push it so fast. Okay. We actually started the LDC that way at one time, at one point. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone want to second Mr. Goodman's motion to adjourn?
Got it. So don't we have to have a uh, oh, public comment? Right. Is that on our agenda or not? What the? Yes. It is. It is, and you should have an opportunity for anyone who's sat through this long to yeah. staff comments board. Make yeah. a comment on anything not on the agenda. Yeah. Public comments. Would anyone like to come up? Public comment. Okay. okay. You'll have to take the podium, Mr. Goodman. Good night. I don't know if this is appropriate to ask right now, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Mr. Langello asked where the industrial districts were on the intercoastal, on account of that's where marinas will be placed. How many C2 properties are there on the intercoastal? That's my question. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we can we can do that. That's that's a good that's a good question. Come back with parcel counts and acreage. I, I, that's fair. Okay. Second motion to adjourn. So moved. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>